All righty, good morning, good morning. I'm Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens, and I am the chair of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, and before I begin, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Cabrera, Adams, Lanceman, Deutsch, and Cohen, and we're also joined by a public advocate, Jamani Williams. All righty, body-worn cameras originated as a way for the federal court in the Floyd case to potentially reduce the number of unconstitutional stop and frisk initiated by police officers. Isn't this hearing timely uh, in light of uh, certain individuals, at least the former mayor, apologizing uh, for these unconstitutional stops? And um, let me just say, while our community is a very forgiven community, we're not a forgetful community, and we will remember. Uh, where he stood on that side of history. To its credit, the NYPD quickly realized the tremendous potential for the additional benefits to the public, as well as its officers. I want to quote some of the language of the remedial order in the Floyd case because it really summarizes the issue well. The recordings will diminish the sense on the part of those who file complaints that it is their word against the police and that the authorities are more likely to believe the police. The recording should also alleviate some of the mistrust that has developed between the police and the black and Hispanic communities based on the belief that stops and frisk are overwhelmingly and unjustifiably directed at members of these communities. The potential of body cameras can only be realized if we get this right. If the policies that are put in place truly inspire the confidence that this technology will be a tool to be used on behalf of New Yorkers, not against us. Based on what I know now, I do have confidence that the NYPD worked very hard to try to get this right. They ran a pilot of their initial procedures and commissioned outside groups to conduct surveys with members of the public as well as NYPD officers to figure out how they could improve their policies. I think a lot of these decisions they made about a lot, I think a lot of the decisions they made about this when recording is mandatory and when recording is prohibited make a lot of sense. But I still have concerns. I'm not thrilled about the reports I'm hearing about how long it takes for them to get body cam footage to the CCRB, which provides an essential oversight function for New Yorkers, but cannot do so without fast, unfettered access to footage. I don't agree with the process that exists today the reasons that have been given for this process, and even the basic notion that the CCRB can't decide for themselves what footage is relevant to their cases. Basic transparency requires someone other than the NYPD to be the gatekeeper of this footage when a member of the public makes a complaint. When an oversight agency is dependent on the discretion of the very agency it is overseeing, what you end up with is the wolf guarding the hen house. We need to do better. I also have concerns about how much discretion is baked into this policy surrounding so-called critical incidents. The policy reads as a series of vague considerations, not a standard for the commissioner to follow. The result is that many people are rightly concerned that the department can decide to release footage only when it looks good for them, and that body cameras are in fact being used as another surveillance tool rather than for the purpose they were intended for accountability, transparency, and to encourage civil interactions between officers and members of the public. To be clear, I don't dispute that there are valid law enforcement benefits to body-worn cameras, and I'm not arguing that the NYPD is trying to pull a fast one on us. I think they have worked hard to try to get this right, but there's always a role for those outside the department to say how they want to be policed. And the promise of body-worn cameras would be wasted if these doubts linger and if the communities who were most impacted by stop and frisk came to view these cameras as tools of oppression and surveillance rather than oversight, reform, and trust building. I know there are valid considerations that support this policy, but there needs to be more clarity about how these decisions will be made, and there needs to be better language clarifying that transparency will be the norm, not the exception. So today, I'm looking forward to hearing how the NYPD ended up with policy choices it has made, how they are using these cameras to guarantee that police-civilian interactions are lawful and respectful, and how we can work together to get this right. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our public advocate, Jamani Williams, for a brief statement. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Jamani Williams, I'm a public advocate for the city of New York. I thank you again and the members of uh, the committee for holding an oversight hearing on the NYPD's use of body cameras. Thank you, uh, NYPD, for being here. In 2013, the city council passed the Community Safety Act, which established an inspector general for the police department and eased the path for those with claims of bias-based policing to file claims in court. When my colleagues and I pushed for these reforms, critics and detractors shunned the legislation and claimed our proposals would reverse the drop in uh, crime in the city, uh, would reverse the drop in crime our city has seen through the 90s and 2000s. We were told the sky was falling and that biospace policing was the best, even the, even, the only we, even the only way we can keep crime down, and that the police needed to continue the abuses of the tactic known as stop, question, and frisk. We were told that adherence to a broken windows mentality and method of quality of life enforcement was necessary to make our streets safer. Uh, as the chair mentioned, it's a pretty uh, apropos day to be having this, given the apology. I even wore my retro button from the time. We knew then that this, or those assumptions were not true. We knew that we, were, we could have better policing and safer streets at the same time, and we were right. For the past six years since passing the Community Safety Act, New Yorkers have experienced the lowest crime numbers in the seven major index crime categories, such as murder, assault, and robbery, than at any other time since the 1950s. I also want to acknowledge that to victims of crimes and their families, those statistics mean absolutely nothing. I also want to acknowledge the recent uptake of shootings in certain areas in our city that needs to be addressed. This, of course, means we must continue to do more. We must also avoid knee-jerk reactions in the favor of advancing the strategies we know work. The bill being heard today, intro 1136, furthers the discussion. The bill requires the police department to submit quarterly public reports on information regarding the use of body-worn cameras. The department would also be mandated to annually publish information on each and every incident requiring an officer to engage body-worn cameras in accordance with department policy. This piece of legislation is essential to ensuring that we will have full dis dis transparency in the information we get from the NYPD. Since the Inspector General's office kicked off in 2014, it has had the chance to look further into policing matters than any other office before it, and has received a tremendous amount of raw data in the form of body-worn camera video. But the millions of body camera videos that the city now has are not public, and there has not been a discussion on how to make those videos available to the public let alone to the victims and their family members. Intro 1136 would give New Yorkers access to information about these body camera videos. The need for greater transparency is evident now more than ever. <clears throat> in April of this year, two police officers were responding to a 9-11 harassment call at Hill House in the Bronx, in which one of them fatally shot a man named Kwaski Trawick. According to NYPD, Trawick charged at them with a knife in one hand and a stick in another. The entire situation was capping on police body cam video, and yet, up until now, Kowalski's family has not been able to see the footage. Just two months ago in the Bronx, a police chase <clears throat> resulted in 15 police bullets killing Brian Malkin, a plain clothes police officer, and Antonio Williams, a civilian whom the police had stopped during a patrol. Officer Malkin did not have his body camera on, but the other five officers on the scene had their cameras on. Although Commissioner O'Neill said in October that the NYPD will be up will end up releasing the footage from the body cameras that show the moments leading up to the shooting. No footage has been released to the public as of yet. The information reported into in, from intro 1136 will not only give families like Kowalski's and Williams and Officer Malkin answers to the question that remain, but also provide them with a small amount of closure. And right now, they have neither. I also recommend the following departmental one policy departmental warn camera policy changes. Share footage with CCRB and district attorneys in the same time frame as federal and state authorities, 24 hours. Reduce the time frame used to disseminate footage to the public. Allow for the release unedited footage to the family and all the public. Provide equal access of the footage to the family members and members of the service. Accountability and transparency are at the heart of intro 1136. It is important that we respect our men and women in blue and provide them the tools they need to do their job. We must also ask that respect, we respect the civilians whom they police. Our communities and the police will be better off if we hold our officers to that standard. I want to thank uh, the chair again for holding this hearing, uh, the speaker as well, Councilmember Lanceman for co-sponsoring this legislation. I'd like to thank a few staff members for helping prepare for today's hearing. 
They include Nick Smith, my first deputy public advocate of policy, Michelle Kim, director of legislation, Crystal Hudson, first deputy advocate, public advocate for community engagement, Rama Issa Ibrahim, deputy public advocate for justice, health, equity, and safety, and Darian Hawley, community organizer for justice, health, and equity. Again, I thank the council for hosting this hearing today, and I look forward to testimony and questions. And as of uh, yesterday's uh, um, happenings uh, with our mayor, I think I always say it's a hallmark of everyone to apologize for, for good leadership, apologize for things that were wrong. My major concerns are the timing of this mayor's apology, and also it comes without any basic framework of how to provide restorative justice to those communities that were harmed for so many years, in addition to officers uh, who have seen harm in their careers uh, for speaking out publicly uh, on this. And so I'm hoping in the time uh, we have until the, May, the president's race that we'll see more discussion about the restorative justice, as well as just for the record, there are policies around housing and education and others during the Bloomberg tenure that I think harmed the same communities. Uh, with that, I thank you. Thank you. All righty, we are joined by Assistant Chief Matthew Pantilo, Pantilo and Assistant Deputy Commissioner Oleg Shravansky. And we're joined by Councilmember Adonis Rodriguez. So I'm going to have Daniel uh, swear you in. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer all questions to the best of your ability? I do. You may begin. Good morning, public advocate, Chair Richards, and members of the council. I am Oleg Tronovsky, Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters for the New York City Police Department. I'm joined today by Assistant Chief Matthew Pontillo, and on behalf of Commissioner James O'Neill, we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the department's use of body-worn cameras. In the last decade, the use of body-worn cameras by police officers has grown exponentially with cameras increasingly becoming standard equipment for modern law enforcement. The benefits of cameras are clear, transparency into police activity, de-escalation of police encounters, and accountability for police officers through an independent account of interactions between the police and the citizens they serve. While they, while they are not a panacea for police accountability, body-worn cameras can serve as a vital part of ongoing efforts to increase trust between the police department and the citizens our brave men and women serve. Body-worn cameras are only one part of our effort to improve trust with the communities we serve. The department has implemented neighborhood policing as a foundational principle to achieve this end and the overarching goal of partnering with our citizenry to fight crime and keep New York City safe. The neighborhood policing philosophy relies on transparency and accountability in order to achieve a lasting trust with the people of this city. There are countless examples of how neighborhood policing has solved and prevented crime, from our NCOs collaborating with community leaders to clean up drug-infested lots, to partnering with building residents to take down violent criminal organizations, to getting the word out about the work our Crime Prevention Division and Precinct Crime Prevention Officers do in providing no-cost security surveys for small businesses, which include making recommendations to harden their physical security in order to prevent robberies and other violent crimes. Body-worn cameras have the ability to provide an objective view of both officers and civilians during everyday interactions. Our officers are crime fighters, problem solvers, de-escalators, liaisons, and community leaders, and body-worn cameras allow more New Yorkers to witness our officers deploying these skills in the most stressful and complicated situations from the officer's perspective. I would like to now take, take you through the evolution of the NYPD's body-worn camera program and where it stands today. In 2013, the NYPD was ordered by a federal court to conduct a body-worn camera pilot in five precincts. At that time, Commissioner Bratton had already on several occasions expressed support for the use of body-worn cameras based on his experience in other jurisdictions. As a result, given the unique needs of this city and the size of this department, we began to study the technology behind body-worn cameras with an eye towards a significantly larger rollout than the one mandated by the court. In anticipation of the larger rollout, the NYPD initiated a pilot, a pilot deploying 54 cameras in six commands from December 2014 through March 2016. 
This pilot helped shape the department's relationship with the technology and the policy considerations going forward. We did not, however, rely solely on this experience when creating our body-worn camera policy. We reached out to the police departments to we reached out to police departments that had already successfully rolled out body-worn cameras, including Seattle, Washington, D.C., Las Vegas, Los Angeles, <coughs> and London's Metropolitan Police. We sought input from a variety of stakeholders, including each district attorney's office, each of the institutional defense providers, and the administrators of the 18B panel, CCRB, the Office of Court Administration, the Public Advocate's Office, the City Council, the New York Civil Liberties Union, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Communities United for Police Reform, the Inspector General's Office, Latino Justice, Demos, and the Citizens Crime Commission. In addition, with assistance from the NYU Policing Project, and with input from the Federal Monitor and the plaintiffs in the Floyd davis Lagan litigation, we conducted a public survey seeking input from everyday New Yorkers. In April of 2017, we released a 53-page report which explained each decision that we made. Obviously, with such a broad and diverse group of stakeholders providing input who at times advocated for diametrically opposed policies, we could not adopt every recommendation provided or every preference expressed by the public, but this experience undoubtedly influenced the creation of the final policy. We also learned how important training is to a successful rollout of a body-worn camera program. We instituted a full-day training, which to my knowledge is the most comprehensive in the country. The training consists of a half-day of classroom lectures followed by a half-day of live scenarios that allow officers to get a feel for how to use body-worn cameras while performing their duties. After releasing our report and policy, in April 2017, the department commenced the first phase of the full body-worn camera rollout. Phase one equipped roughly 1,200 officers on the 3 to 11 tour in 20 commands. At the same time, experts on the federal monitors team identified 20 control precincts of similar size demographics and crime rates in order to compare a variety of factors in simultaneously in, in similarly situated commands. The federal monitor is currently working on this report and once complete it will be one of the largest studies ever produced on the effectiveness of body-worn cameras. The department remained committed to the use of body-worn cameras and after equipping the pilot commands we began aggressively expanding our program. In December 2017, phase two commenced, and upon completion of this, pa and upon completion this past February, all uniformed patrol officers are now equipped with cameras, as well as detectives performing patrol duties and sergeants and lieutenants assigned to, pre assigned to precincts, transit districts, and police service areas, numbering over 20,000 in total. Phase three, which provided an additional 4,000 cameras, uh, 4,000 or so cameras to specialty units such as the Emergency Service Unit, the Strategic Response Group, and the Critical Response Command was completed recently, bringing the initial rollout to a close. Additionally, we have nearly completed the ongoing process of issuing body-worn cameras to executives, captains through inspectors assigned to commands which employ body cameras. Our body-worn camera program is continuously being studied, scrutinized, and updated. As a result, body-worn cameras are now an, imp an important aspect of the NYPD's training and disciplinary framework, and each officer undergoes a full day of live training on their use. The Training Bureau is also continually integrating body-worn camera footage into all aspects of training at all levels. For recruits in the academy, the in-person continuing subject matter trainings for uniformed and civilian members of the service and in our various online trainings which are used, used by all members of the service. Footage is also used to ensure our officers are in compliance with the strict patrol guide procedures governing the use of body cameras. Officers must activate their cameras during all investigative and enforcement actions with some obvious exceptions, such as undercover operations, interviewing victims of sex crimes, and when inside of a medical facility. 
At the end of each officer's tour, they are required to place the camera into a recharging station, which automatically uploads the captured footage into a cloud storage system, rendering it impossible for anyone to alter or tamper with the saved footage. All footage is retained for a minimum of 18 months, but longer when needed as evidence in a criminal or civil proceeding. <coughs> Though it is important to view every video, the NYPD has instituted procedures to ensure compliance with the patrol guide's requirements. The department randomly selects videos that each sergeant must review and assess. The sergeant is required to evaluate an officer on a variety of factors, including whether they were professional and courteous, whether the officer conducted a stop in, the, in a constitutional manner, and the officer's tactics. In addition, the department audits a sample of arrests, stops, summonses, uses of force in aided cases to ensure that the body-worn camera was turned on during mandatory acti activation events. In the, in the last 28-day period, we had a 92% compliance rate during our audits. In this respect, the NYPD is ahead of the curve, as until recently, we were the only large police department conducting audits of this kind. Last month, in the NYPD's ongoing effort to foster a culture of greater transparency, the department issued, issued a presumptive release policy, which is committed to publicly release footage of critical incidents captured by our body-worn camera, cameras within 30 days, with limited exceptions, while also balancing privacy concerns, protecting against compromising criminal investigations, and the need to comply with federal, state, and local disclosure laws. I want to highlight that the 30-day time frame is a maximum. Footage may be released, released sooner, but 30 days may be necessary in cases to allow depart the department to adequately assess legal and privacy concerns and to undertake a labor-intensive redaction process so that uninvolved individual and juveniles are not easily identifiable. Any person may obtain body-worn camera footage of themselves through the FOIL process, and any footage capturing evidence related to a criminal case is turned over to the district attorney's offices and will be provided to defendants through the criminal discovery process. So far this year, there have been approximately 870 FOIL requests seeking body camera footage with over 3,000 responsive videos provided. Each officer has the ability to share their body-worn camera footage with the appropriate district attorney's office prosecuting their arrest immediately through a video sharing portal that was created for just this purpose. Additionally, the department provides footage to the CCRB that is relevant to the disciplinary cases they investigate. So far this year, the, C the CCRB has made approximately 3,700 requests, which generated almost 14,000 500 responsive videos. This is up from 2,080 such requests in 2018, which saw 6,134 responsive videos. It is important to stress that any single request by, by and large does not amount to only one responsive video. In fact, with the ever-expanding distribution of cameras by this department, there are generally multiple vi responsive videos to any one request. And at times, there are dozens of responsive videos for each request. Although the planned rollout has only recently been completed, and the largest portion only completed in February, the department has accumulated approximately 8 million videos. These videos have an average duration of over 8 minutes, and approximately 130,000 new videos are uploaded to the cloud each week. I would like I would now like to take a moment to comment on the bill being heard today. Intro 1136 would require the NYPD to report on, a, on various data points related to the department's use of body-worn cameras. While the department supports the goal of transparency, we cannot support this legislation as currently written. The bill would require us to report on data which could not be captured without a trained analyst watching and listening to every recording in its entirety, then conducting an investigation to, cap to gather additional data points. Data points such as whether images were recorded and the reason if not, whether a camera failed at any time to record audio or video, whether the audio is at any time unintelligible, 
whether the visual clarity was compromised in any way at any time during the recording, whether an officer informed the subject that they were being recorded, whether an individual stopped the recording prior to when they should have, whether on, on purpose or by accident, and the race, gender, and age of the individual recorded. As I mentioned before, we have recorded approximately 8 million videos and are adding roughly 130,000 more videos each week. The average length of the videos is over eight minutes. Performing a rough calculation to watch just 130,000 videos each week, we would have to hire and train approximately 800 new analysts slash investigators, and, the, and that is not even accounting for the millions of videos on hand or future expansion of the program. This would be a significant undertaking, to say the least. Lastly, as for whether a video was used as part of a CCRB investigation, the CCRB is be best left to answer whether this is feasible. However, this department should not be placed in a position where we are left questioning the CCRB about the evidence they determine is relevant in connection with, with their investigation. I would just like to highlight uh, to the public advocate that what we are not saying is that we are opposed to a reporting bill about our body-worn camera program. It is just the way this particular bill is structured, but we would absolutely be willing to sit down with you and work through a reporting bill that gives greater transparency into our program, uh, taking into account how the program runs and what the data points are that it currently captures. Uh, with that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. All righty, thank you so much, Oleg. So originally the judge and Floyd litigation ordered you to do a pilot to see if body worn cameras would reduce the number of unconstitutional stops, right? Yes, that is correct. Right. And at some point during that pilot, the department decided to go ahead and just expand the pilot to all officers. Can you talk about the reasons why the department decided to go ahead with the expansion before the results of the pilot came out? So. The court order was released in 2013 ordering this pilot to examine whether or not, as you indicated, <clears throat> body cameras were effective in reducing the number of unconstitutional stops. In January of 2014, the administration changed. Police Commissioner Bratton came in. Police Commissioner Bratton uh, explained to us that he had had considerable experience with body cameras uh, through his prior work and was a believer in the efficacy of body cameras. And uh, irrespective of the court's ultimate finding, which was limited to just stop and frisk, uh, he knew that body cameras had great potential uh, in many, many other areas beyond just stop and frisk. And he wanted to move ahead. And beginning by about March of 2014, he commissioned several of us to begin looking at other police departments, their body camera programs, begin researching the technology, uh, begin looking at model policies and uh, to begin to uh, uh, prepare the way for uh, an eventual citywide deployment of body cameras. Uh, and then along those same lines, working with the federal monitor, so if you look at uh, the federal monitor's research model, uh, what they're currently looking at, it goes well beyond stop and frisk. And uh, we agreed to that and encouraged that, uh, working with him and his team and the plaintiffs, because we wanted to do a much more comprehensive research uh, than was originally contemplated by the court order. And can you just ex expand a little bit on Bratton's reasoning a little bit more? You mentioned it a little bit outside well, of. Well, I, I, you know, I, I can't speak for Commissioner Bratton. I, I just know what he expressed uh, to me and some others when we talked about body cameras. Uh, that he believed in their, uh, the importance of, of de-escalation and their ability to help de-escalate situations. Uh, and also, like Judge Shindlin pointed out in her order, provide a contemporaneous record of what transpired, which could have many, many uses uh, going forward. Right, and I remember officer safety also being a part of that conversation as well. Um, so in addition to holding officers accountable, you found that cameras would also foster more traditional law enforcement goals? Well, I think like any other point of information, uh, body camera video is a piece of evidence. Uh, it is a record, uh, just like cell phone video from bystanders or security camera video uh, from uh, storefronts, uh, witness statements, uh, 
you know, other forensic uh, or extrinsic uh, evidence that may be examined during the course of any investigation or any inquiry, th there are many, many data points that people can look at, whether it's CCRB, whether it's uh, internal in the NYPD, whether it's a DA, defense counsel, uh, it's, it's another data point uh, that provides uh, a piece of the overall picture that can help somebody who is reviewing something determine what occurred. Right. And I know you spent a lot of time crafting your policies and soliciting feedback for these policies, and your, and your process is commendable. I think you named a lot of organizations um, that you certainly work with, and, and that is to be commended. But the main issue I want to focus on is whether the policies you ended up with are sufficiently geared toward accountability and transparency rather than what's good for the department. So can you talk about some of the policies you have in place that help the public feel confident that officers are following the law and treating people with respect? Uh, sure, so I'll, I'll touch on, on a couple of things. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Judge Shinlin's court order uh, and, and some of what she described as the purpose and the scope of the body camera pilot. You know, she also pointed out uh, that the monitor would establish the policy for the pilot and that the policy had to balance the competing interests of transparency and personal privacy of the people who were recorded on video. Uh, when we look back, you know, during our research, the American Civil Liberties Union published a, a policy paper back in 2004 talking about body cameras. And they talked about the great potential that body cameras offered. You know, having this contemporaneous record, uh, objective record of what occurred between people uh, at the time it occurred, available for later review. But they also cautioned that body cameras, unlike many other forms of evidence or even cell phone video or security camera video had the potential to be very, very intrusive. Police officers are routinely called into people's homes for a whole variety of things. So, you know, imagine uh, the average uh, uh, police officer uh, responds to a call, they turn on their body camera, uh, they're capturing information inside of people's homes, they're recording family members present, they're recording very intimate details of what's going on with that family in that situation. So th the information captured can be extremely, extremely sensitive. You know, fast forward, the Inspector General for the New York City Police Department, they did a report on body cameras uh, around the time we were getting ready to launch phase one of our citywide rollout. And, and they made a series of recommendations based upon uh, the policy we had in place for the earlier, you know, 2014 mini pilot. And, you know, they talked about the concerns around transparency and the tension with personal privacy. And their recommendation uh, was that, you know, we stick, we adhere to the requirements of FOIL, uh, state law that governs how public records are analyzed and released to make sure that we're protecting vulnerable populations uh, and protecting certain classes uh, that are protected by state statute, like juveniles, and like the victims of sex offenses. So that's been a very effective working model for us. In terms of the operational policy, when we began with our mini pilot, uh, which ran from December of 2014 through March of 2016, it was a small number. It was uh, 54 cameras and, and six commands uh, using all volunteers, and the policy was based upon that preliminary research. We made significant changes to the policy based upon lessons learned. We also made significant changes to the training based upon lessons learned from that mini pilot. So when we roll out phase one, which was part of our citywide deployment in April of 2017, we had a new policy. Now because that phase one satisfied the court order in the Floyd case, that policy had to be approved by the monitor, and it was. Uh, and we worked with him and his staff and plaintiffs very, very closely to create that policy. And we landed on a policy that requires recording of all investigative and enforcement type activities or activities that are likely to result in or, or may result in some investigative or enforcement action. So certainly arrests, summonses, vehicle stops, Terry stops, uh, interior patrols in NYCHA buildings, uh, any situation that becomes adversarial or confrontational, uh, any request to search. Uh, so th these are all the things that, you know, fell within that area where there is some interaction with a member of the public uh, that, that could be, uh, 
adversarial or law enforcement related. We excluded things like routine ambulance cases, uh, you know, a sick call in somebody's residence, uh, responding to past crimes, uh, responding to non-emergency calls or pickups of non-emergencies, as well as just kind of routine conversations. Again, we try to balance uh, the need for having that contemporaneous record of an interaction between a police officer and a member of the public that could be contentious uh, versus the more, uh, I hate to say routine or traditional calls for service, uh, where you know some very, very, in many cases, very, very private matters are being discussed uh, and not necessarily appropriate for recording on video, uh, especially if there's the possibility of later public release of some of this uh, information. So that was the framework with which we designed the original operational policy back in 2017 and why we made the choices that we did. Uh, like any policy, it's been under review ever since. Uh, we've made some adjustments to training along the way. We anticipate uh, in, in the near future we will revise the policy again. We'll probably add a couple of more categories uh, of uh, events that police officers get involved in, like responding to disputes. Uh, you know, those can escalate. Uh, currently, disputes, domestic disputes, not covered unless it's a crime in progress. Uh, so that's one area we're looking at, uh, as well as some others. So we expect, like any policy, uh, department policies are always under review. No policy is ever written with the idea that it will exist in perpetuity, but rather it's an evolution. And this whole thing has been an evolution since early 2014 when we began the research. Right. And I'm glad you're, you're open to reevaluating the categories that are currently excluded, um, especially ambulance calls, um, non-emergency calls. In some cases, we are obviously going through a really um, tough time when it, when it relates to mental health challenges. And, uh, and I would hope that that category would also um, be included, being that we're seeing a lot more things escalate um, so we, we Basel, other situations I just wanted to throw out there. Absolutely, so, yeah. So yeah. We, we do make a distinction in the current policy. Anything that uh, comes over uh, is assigned as an emotionally disturbed person. Uh, that is a must record situation. Uh, you know, again, recognizing the potential volatility of, of those cases. Uh, there are other ambulance cases, you know, like cardiacs, injuries, uh, things like that, which on their face may not appear. Uh, to rise to that level, uh, but we also direct uh, our offices in training that irrespective of how something comes over, how something is assigned, or what you originally think it is, if upon arrival you determine it's something else and it's one of the must record scenarios, what a situation evolves, then you need to immediately, uh, safety permitting, turn your camera on and begin recording once you realize the nature of the event is other than what you originally expected. I'm going to come back for more questions because I know my colleagues have some, and I, I want to hop quickly into um, just logistics and activation of the cameras. So can you just go through how do officers actually activate the camera, and can you explain how the 30-second buffering period works in terms of starting the record? Absolutely. Great, great questions. Uh, so right now we're using uh, two different models of body cameras. Uh, currently in service, we have the VView LE4 camera, and we also have the Axon AB2 model camera. Uh, we have about 15,000 or 16,000 VView LE4s, and uh, the balance, uh, another uh, six or 7,000 uh, Axon Body 2s. Uh, beginning next month, we're going to begin deploying the Axon Body 3 camera, which is the AB3, which is their newest model of camera. Uh, the cameras are fundamentally the same or similar. Uh, they are devices that record audio and video. The Axon, uh, the VView body camera, uh, they, they all have, let me back up, excuse me, they, they all have a power switch and a record switch. So in the policy and in the training, we direct that uh, immediately uh, prior to roll call, police officer goes to the docking station retrieves their camera, every camera is individually assigned to a specific police officer, turns the power on, and affixes the camera to their outermost garment uh, approximately chest high between the pockets. We want to get the optimal point of view, and depending upon the time of year it is and what garment they're wearing may affect the exact placement 
and we've been working with the manufacturers over the last uh, two years to further refine the different mounting clips that are available to give us the best options for our uniforms. Uh, similarly, the Axon uh, AV2 camera uh, retrieved from the docking station has a power button. Power button is to be depressed so that the camera boots up and turns on. To begin recording, the cameras operate a little bit differently. The V-View has a slide switch uh, on the surface of the camera. So just below the lens, there's a switch. Uh, with your thumb, you can depress that switch and slide it down. The camera will begin recording. To stop recording, you slide the switch back up. Axon functions differently. Uh, it has, in the center of the camera, there is a slightly recessed push button. You push the button twice to begin recording, push the button once and hold for three to five seconds to end recording. Uh, but other than that, in, in terms of video being captured uh, on the camera, uh, the only way to get it off the camera is to dock it in a docking station, then it uploads to the storage solution uh, where it then becomes available through the NYPD network. Uh, in terms of the buffer, the VView cameras have a 30-second buffer, the Axon cameras have a one-minute buffer. And what the buffer is, a great way to think about it, uh, it's, it's a virtual time machine. So as long as the camera, as long as the power on the camera is turned on, the camera is constantly recording video. It's just not saving it. So in the case of the VView camera, it's on a 30-second loop, and every 30 seconds, the, v, the video is being overwritten. Uh, in the case of the Axon camera, it's recording uh, one minute's worth of video, and it's constantly overwriting that video as uh, more video is being captured. Except when you press the record switch, either on the VView cameras by sliding the button down, or on the Axon EV2 cameras by pressing the record button twice, what that does is from that moment going forward, the camera is recording both audio and video, but it's also going backwards and preserving the preceding either 30 seconds in the case of VView or the preceding one minute in case of Axon. Uh, so essentially it is a 30 second or a one minute time machine, which can be very, very effective and very, very important, especially when something happens spontaneously you don't expect. So you have that ability to go back uh, and you, won't have, you don't have audio for the buffer period, but you do have video, which can be helpful in seeing what led up to a situation, especially when something occurs spontaneously. Right, and one of the reasons I asked that question is because you spoke of cities you consulted with. And I wanted to know, did you consult with Atlanta, Houston, and DC on their buffering time? So in, in, tho in those particular cities, um, the time is two minutes. Um, to really make sure everything is captured. So why didn't the NYPD look at a two minute So we, we looked at that currently, so with the VView LE4 camera, they are not programmable. It's only 30 seconds. Uh, there, there is no other option with, with the LE4 camera. Uh, with the Axon camera, it is configurable. Uh, we're still at one minute. Uh, we, we have, looked at and thought about extending it, but presently we're still at one minute. And we, we haven't seen a situation or enough situations where uh, we think it would be helpful to go back further. Well, we haven't seen any situations yet. So, so you're open to ex extending the time from it's, one minute to two. It's something we're constantly looking at. Okay. We're, we're always looking at the technology. So for example, uh, just looking at the systems and how they function, uh, the functionality on the dashboard for managing the video, uh, the features of the cameras, these are things we're always looking at and we're always working with the vendor uh, to make improvements. And is there any reason not to go with the longer buffering period? Uh, it primarily concerns about privacy uh, because the longer you go back, now you're capturing information, maybe bringing you back into the locker room, into the bathroom, uh, into, um, time spent uh, in the car driving to a location. Uh, you know, we, we have had situations where even with the shorter buffer, uh, we've captured some personal information like that, uh, and we've had to take action to uh, lock that down or redact it. Uh, so th that's, that's the, you know, 
uh, countervailing concern or the competing interest are the individual privacy concerns of individual police officers. Well, I love hearing the NYPD's concern about privacy. Absolutely. Um, so that means you're going to support the Post Act and uh, support more reforms around the DNA database and the gang database. Is that a yes? I defer to my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, I look forward to passing those bills. Oleg, are you going to give me a yes on all the bills? Yeah, we'll stick to the legislation <laughs> on the table today, and we'll, we'll deal uh, with those at a later date. Uh, all right, let's, let's just uh, lastly go into just, uh, so obviously you know I have not been shy about my concerns around the CCRB uh, not getting immediate access to um, body cam footage. Uh, but the district attorneys are given direct access, correct? So it's... Um, I need to explain that I think the word direct access is actually misused in the, the nobody has direct access. The, I'm sorry, the, it's downloaded and yeah, well, what, yeah, what happened? No, but that's important. I don't mean I don't mean that you are misusing it. It's okay. the term I, of art uh, has been used a lot of times, both in the papers and by various stakeholders, to argue the point that somehow the DAs are surfing uh, PD databases, looking at videos, and that's not the way the system works. There's a sharing portal that's been developed, so if there is a video that's relevant to a district attorney's case, the police officer is able to share that video through the portal. It's not a matter of direct access where the DAs are actually going into the PD database and looking up stuff on their own. It's they're actually accessing video through a shared portal. Um, so just go through, so the DAs, um, log into software or something? Can you just speak a little bit on that? Yeah, so, oh, go ahead. Yeah, so the, the DAs, um, and we, we've had to set up two systems because we, we're currently operating with two camera systems, VView and, and Axon. So yes, they were, uh, through their networks, uh, portals were created where they could log in to a, a dashboard essentially where they would have access to body camera video. And the way they get access, it's not all, you know, almost 8 million videos, but rather when a police officer makes an arrest or a detective is investigating a case uh, and then makes an arrest, uh, they have the ability to go into the video management system. And it's very simple, really, with a couple of clicks. Uh, there's, uh, once they identify their video, they can click on this function to share. Uh, and then there is uh, essentially a Rolodex that they can find uh, each uh, the appropriate DA's office in, uh, click on that DA's office, and then click share. And then it goes to that shared portal uh, where it is then available to the DA's. And then on the DA side, each of them manages the video differently in terms of how they download it and, and how they process it. And the CCRB have the same ability? They do not. And so, can you explain why not? Yeah, so uh, the, w with respect to CCRB, as I said, you know, the, they're probably our largest customer by far in terms of the number of videos they re request. Uh, but unlike uh, the district attorney's office, uh, which is a state uh, prosecutorial entity, um, CCRB is still subject to certain state laws uh, with respect to um, uh, sealed records, juvenile records, 50B, sex crime um, victim identifying information and the like. So there are certain redactions that generally need to be made. With that said, uh, we've, we've worked very hard uh, at uh, streamlining and reducing the turnaround time when it comes to CCRB. As I said, so far this year, 3,700 requests produced 14,500 videos, and um, and we're still working towards more. So the, there's a uh, misnomer that one request equals one video. Th that's just not true. Now with more and more officers wearing uh, body cam videos, and at a minimum, you're going to have two officers responding to the scene of a crime, so you'll have two videos. Generally speaking, you have multiple videos for every incident. And in some cases, one request equates to 100 videos or more, uh, depending on what the situation is. Uh, so what happens, so what we've been doing with CCRB is we overlay those state laws and we're turning around the videos as quickly as possible. 
and we've been working collaboratively with them to streamline the process even further and to reduce the, the turnaround times even more. And we're anticipating that uh, we'll be able to do that, uh, especially in the near future, to uh, hopefully almost eliminate any kind of uh, delay in turnaround time. And let me just say, um, so you cited um, 50B, and the DAs, as you said, do get direct access without any redactions, correct? Well, the DAs are the prosecutorial entity, so if you have, for example, 50B, uh, they would not be subject to that because they're prosecuting the case, so obviously they'd, they'd have access to that information. And it's been reported that you have withheld footage while IAB investigations are pending. Why can't you give them the footage so that they can do their jobs while the IAB investigates as well? Well, I mean, that's not completely true. Uh, there are certain cases that are being investigated uh, internally by IAB, uh, not all cases uh, investigated by IAB. So there's a, a lot, a significant number of cases where there are concurrent investigations going on by CCRB and IAB, and there are some investigations that IAB is conducting where those videos are not provided uh, pending the completion of the IAB investigation. And um, I'm going to, before I pass it over to my colleagues, I want to read a quote to you from a letter sent by the chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board, Fred Davey, to the U.S. House of Representatives Judiciary Committee. Acquiring body-worn camera footage in New York City requires a CCRB to first request it from the NYPD, whose, rep whose representatives serve as a gatekeeper, unilaterally determining who may access footage of its officers. He goes on in a letter to say he wants direct access to the footage. Um, why do you have to be the gatekeeper? Can't you just give access to the CCRB so they can look for the footage they need to investigate their cases? So, I, I mean, again, it's, and I, I think, um, you know, the chief eloquently explained what the process is. We have their state law issues, so there is a difference between the entities. But again, I don't want to really you know, get, get down into, um, into these sort of disagreements because I think what we are doing is working collaboratively with CCRB and I think we are in a good place now in terms of turnaround and we anticipate being in a far better place with respect to providing them access to videos. All righty, I'm going to come back uh, for more comments and questions later, but just wanted to state that uh, it's taken far too long, in my opinion, and I'm sure the CCRB is not here, but at least based on what we've heard for them to get direct access to footage. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to see a lot more improvements in that area. I know you, you um, stated 50B it certainly prevents access in some scenarios, um, but we find it unacceptable at this point that uh, we have not moved uh, in the name of transparency, which leads to accountability in a quicker fashion to make sure that they are gaining access. So I've heard that you're making some progress there, but you know, if we're serious about achieving the goals of the body camera program, the agency that has direct oversight over the NYPD needs unfettered access. And so I'm hoping that um, as we make progress in that area, that you're going to come back with a more robust and strategic plan to make sure that we achieve that goal. Um, I want to uh, recognize Council Members Rodriguez, I think I did that already, Powers, Menchaca, Gibson, and we're going to go to Council Member Lanceman, followed by Lanceman, Adams, and then Cohen for questions. Good morning. Good morning. I want to, um, some of the ground I'm going to cover may have been covered by the, the chair over the course of his questioning, but I want to root my questions in the language of the operations order, operations order number 46. And it says, in the event that a federal and or state prosecuting authority opens an official investigation into a critical incident, the department will share all relevant BWC footage with the prosecuting authority within 24 hours of the department being notified of the investigation. Now, I think you've testified the CCRB is not considered a prosecuting authority? No, I, what, I'm, what I testify to is that there are certain laws that CCRB is subject to, but again, as I said to, to the chair, that we're working through 
Uh, aren't, aren't, there, aren't there laws that the DA's offices are, are subject to? Well, as the prosecuting guitar, uh, authority, they are getting uh, 50B cases, certainly, with respect to sealed records. We would, they're getting the case at the time of arrest, so at that point, that record would not be a sealed I, record. Is, is there anywhere in this order where the MIPD specifically uh, describes the process for the CCRB getting uh, access to these 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 records well, that the, that that distinguishes the CCRB from the general public. No, I mean this order is a. I mean, if you notice at the top under operations order, it says the subject is public release of body worn camera footage. We don't consider CCRB to be the public. Is, are uh, the DAs the public? The DAs are not the The U.S. Public. Attorney's Office the public? They are not the public. No, but nonetheless, they are referenced, I assume, by being a federal and or state right. prosecuting authority. Correct. And as I said, you know, and I'll, I'll say it again, that we are working with the CCRB. There are issues with certain laws that they're subject to, which delays the turnaround time, unlike the other agencies. But again, we're working with them. We're working through it. The turnaround time has been significantly reduced and it's going to be significantly, it's going to be hopefully eliminated. With that said, as I said in my testimony, we have so far this year 3,700 requests. We've provided 14,500 videos. This is but just the CCRB. No, no, nonetheless, so, nonetheless, from the CCRB, more than half of all footage requests made by the CCRB are pending for more than 30 days. And that is a significant impediment to their conducting their investigations, both because they want to get into the investigations as soon as possible, where recollections are freshest, evidence is still available, but also they're operating under a fairly strict statute of limitations. So it, everything that I've heard and, and seen is that the CCRB has a different um, uh, per perception on whether or not the NYPD is turning over this body camera footage in a timely and efficient manner. And the fact that there is no uh, specific uh, process for turning over body-worn camera footage to the CCRB, CCRB in this operations order that distinguishes the CCRB from the general public, that recognizes that the CCRB, okay, perhaps they're not a state or federal prosecutory, uh, prosecuting authority, and they have different rules and obligations and powers, there's still quite a bit more than the public. And so uh, it's very disturbing to me that this order lacks a clear mechanism for getting uh, uh, BWC uh, footage to the CCRB in a timely matter. Let's go to the next sentence in the order. In addition, the department will decide when to publicly release BWC footage of a critical incident within 30 calendar days excluding any non-disclosure periods provided that the force investigation review is complete. So this is the department is not committing to releasing the footage to the public within 30 days, but merely making a decision about releasing the footage to the public as I read it. Is there any further obligation that once that decision is made within the 30 days, within X number of days from that, the footage that is going to be released has to be released? Well, I think, uh, unless I'm misunderstanding it. Or am I reading this too narrowly? It is within 30 days. The it's within, that's right. So that, that procedure, uh, as, as Oleg indicated, that procedure just addresses public release of body camera video. The, the workflow for dealing with CCRB, the, there is a process for that. It's just not codified. No, I get it. We've, we've moved on from the CCRB. So, this is a sentence that relates to the public. So this this procedure, uh, and, and this goes back to the publication of the original operational procedure back in 2017. So if you look at that procedure, uh, there's a small paragraph at the end that says, you know, release of video is uh, the prerogative of the police commissioner and he will decide uh, as appropriate when to release. Beginning in late 2017, uh, we were releasing body camera video related to critical incidents. And what this procedure does is a continuation of that and actually outlines 
the deliberative process that the police commissioner needs to go through and the department needs to go through. I'm, when preparing I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just have to ask, because maybe I didn't ask the question properly. Am I reading this sentence too narrowly? Yes. The, but, this, this so, so does this sentence mean this that procedure creates a presumption of release within 30 days? Yes. All right, not merely the decision to release is within 30 days, but the actual release will be in 30 days. Yes, absent some subject to the carve outs, the qualifications, etc. I'm just talking about the time. Okay. Next. The department will release representative samples of the BWC videos depicting the critical incident, as well as any salient events leading up to the event. Extraneous and or redundant material may be omitted. I don't think it's news to you that there is a sense among a large number of the public that these body-worn camera videos are being released, edited, with selective information that um, produce a narrative that is most favorable to the police department and to the officers involved. So can you tell me what safeguards are in place to ensure that the uh, discretion to limit footage to that which is salient or which is representative is not going to be used to um, uh, tell a, a, a story of what happened that is favorable to the officers involved rather than just putting it out to the public and letting the public make its own judgment? Well, I think, uh, one, there needs to be context to videos, right? So if what you have is a video of a police officer walking up to somebody without knowledge of why they're walking up to somebody, without having relevant information, you, the video is, is taken out of context. Now, that is not to say that there will be this, um, you know, this salient events leading up to the video that is relevant information for the public to see, to get the video in full context. Also, there is, as the chief explained, the but it's video, usually, it's the usually the case that when you're the removing... Video in its entirety... But it's is, usually the case that when you're, when, you're, when you're editing video, when you're cutting something out, right, the video you're in removing its entirety context. is preserved. So there is a full record of that uh, body cam footage, right? So there would be a video with salient events giving context to the encounter, but there is also the full video that is available. Right, so why not well. release the f full video? Subject to... Listen... I, I get that there are caveats regarding privacy, et cetera. We'll, we'll get to that, right? Mm -hmm. But once you've decided that this amount of footage is not subject to any of those qualifications or caveats, why should the department then be making an additional judgment about what's salient, what's representative? Just release the footage to the public. Footage would be released, but there's other information that's important to give context to the video. I don't think it's, I mean, unless we're arguing against greater transparency here, I mean, I think the video will be provided, and unless we're arguing that we should limit the disclosure to the no, public no, the, to, not, well, to the, not give them salient the information. Literal, the literal meaning of the term representative sample, a mm -hmm. sample is a subset of the whole. But that's not, it is not saying that the, in, the video in its entirety is not going to be provided. We're talking about the release of critical information on a, on a time frame that is more likely than not more expedited than any type of FOIL process or FOIL request. Well, that's, but, the, well, so, that's, but that's a problem, right. right? Because if you're releasing video, with, let's say within 30 days, a judgment is made that this video includes a critical incident and this amount of footage is not subject to any of the exclusions. The public and I would want the NYPD to release the entirety of that footage. And that's, we, preci and that's precisely what we're striving to do. But, but this says something different. This says that you're going to represent, that you're going to release, that you may release a, re a representative sample, mm -hmm. which means a subset of the footage that is available, that extraneous and or redundant, redundant material may be omitted. So what these two sentences say, quite literally, is that 
from the footage that is available to be released that isn't subject to these other carve-outs, we are not going to release the entirety of that footage. We are only going to release subsets of it. We're going to release that which is a representative sample in our judgment. We're going to exclude extraneous and redundant material in our judgment. So my question is, why not release all of the footage that is not subject to some of the uh, privacy and investigative carve-outs that are enumerated elsewhere in the order? I'm sorry. Can you why not release all of the footage that is not subject to some of the carve-outs related to privacy and the investigative process that is enumerated elsewhere in the order? Why well, only I mean, that's precisely what we're striving to do. If, if it is possible, I mean, again, like I said, there could be video, uh, hundreds of pieces of footage, depending on the incident, depending on the number of responding officers. If what we're looking to do is wait until we're able to look at all hundreds of pieces of footage, put them through the process that you correctly are saying some of these exemptions, some of these redactions are valid redactions. If that's what we're waiting to do, then okay. I mean, that may certainly delay the process. What we are striving to do is to give this type of sample where possible to attach a more comprehensive video to it when you have a situation where there is just so much video footage that it's not feasible to turn it around that quickly. Uh, you may have a situation where we're putting out something of great public interest rather than simply being silent for an extended amount of time. Well, so I think, again, look, there needs to be a common sense policy. Uh, as the chief said, there is no policy that we ever write that we take the approach this is written in stone, we'll never go back, review it, or change it. But this is the policy that we put out now. It's only about a couple of weeks old. Let's see how it works. If there are problems with it, if there are issues, uh, we'll certainly, we're open to addressing them. We've done that with our current body cam policy since the inception of the policy. As the chief said, the training's have been changed, the policy's been updated. It's a work in progress. We're always learning. I mean, the idea here is to be transparent and to give the public this vital information uh, with as little delay as possible. If, um, if there's ways to do it better, we're certainly open to that. Here's a way to do it better, okay? Whatever footage is available and not subject to any of the carve-outs that are enumer enumerated in this order that relate to privacy, and, and interfering with the investigative process, that footage should be released. It should not be edited uh, subject to any subjective editing on the part of the department in terms of what kind of sample is representative or what kind of information the department de de deems to be extraneous. At some point in the future, something's gonna happen in this city. The department's gonna put out footage if that footage is not a complete representation of everything, a, a, a complete account of everything captured on the body camera, uh, 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 by the body cameras, you have not succeeded in earning the trust of the public where people can say, I see with my own eyes everything that happened. People will wonder, well, what's missing? This is a representative sample. What did they withhold? This, is, this excludes extraneous. Well, what's extraneous? And I think that you should really change this policy so that everything is produced except those things which are subject to those, um, those caveats which you, which you enumerate. One last thing, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, I don't see anything in here about providing uh, video footage to a defendant's defense counsel. Um, is it the department's position that access to that information has got to be obtained through the district attorneys, through the criminal procedure discovery process? Sure. So uh, I, I address that in my testimony that will the arresting officer will share the relevant video with the DA. The DA will transfer that information to the defense counsel or self-represented uh, defendant uh, directly as part of the 
criminal discovery process. Now, that, that's not to say that there is no mechanism for an individual to get it directly from the department. There's a FOIL process, there's a subpoena process. There are mechanisms to get it directly from the department. It's just, I would imagine, significantly quicker to get it from a district attorney if you're at arraignment, especially now with the new discovery laws where the turnaround time is gonna be within 15 days. Uh, I, I just think that's a much faster process, but there's certainly other processes that would take longer that these individuals can use. That may be so. Let's see what happens with the new discovery laws kicking in. Um, I definitely do, though, I definitely want to express my disappointment with this policy insofar as it still gives the NYPD too much discretion on what kind of footage uh, to release. And this document, secondarily, reflects the NYPD's ongoing unwillingness to fully cooperate with the CCRB so that it could do its job. And I would like to see a change to this order where there is a mechanism in place to promptly and efficiently give the CCRB the information it needs so it can do the task that the public has, has charged it with. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna to go to Councilmember Adams, followed by Adams, Cohen, Menchaca, Gibson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, Assistant Deputy Commissioner and Assistant Chief, thank you for being here today and for your testimony thus far. Um, just agreeing with my colleague, Councilmember Lansman, uh, I am in full, full agreement that the public has to have faith in this policy. The public has to believe that what the NYPD is putting forth is something that they can believe in, something that they can trust. And so far, what I've heard this morning gives a lot of concern. Uh, for me, I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit of what the uh, what the public advocate Jamani Williams uh, testified to just a little while ago. And I'm paraphrasing. In April of this year, two police officers were responding to a 9-11 harassment call at Hill House in the Bronx, in which one of them fa fatally shot a man named Kowalski Trawick. The entire situation was captured on police body camera video, and yet, up until now, Kowalski's family has not been able to see the footage. Additionally, just two months ago in the Bronx, a police chase resulted in 15 police bullets killing Brian Mulkeen, a plainclothes officer, and Antonio Williams, a civilian, whom the police had stopped during a patrol. Officer, Officer Mulkeen did not have his body camera on, but the other five officers on the scene had their cameras on. Now, my question is, we, we are deep into the process right now with all of these incidents uh, at this point. So can you give us any insight as to why the footage, no pieces of the footage on any of these incidents has been released to the public yet? So, uh, and thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, the, the policy, the release policy has just come out. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. We are anticipating a release, uh, the initial release imminently, um, and moving forward we will be releasing along the lines of what the first release is going to be. So that'll be a good sample to, to you know, for everyone to see how we're going to be releasing these videos. Uh, as you know, there was a court injunction for a time, so there were videos. I think there were a handful of videos that were released originally. Then there was a injunction in place for, I think, almost a year and a half, uh, about a year and a half. Um, so we weren't releasing at that point because of the injunction. Once the injunction was lifted, we began working on the policy uh, that, that you see before you, and we're going to start releasing based on this policy very shortly. So um, with respect to the case that you brought up and, and the family, um, what has happened traditionally because of the sensitivities involved in those cases is the district attorneys are the ones that coordinate uh, letting the families view the video. Um, and it's generally done through them. We provide, obviously, the video to them, and then they had shared those videos with the family. So I'm not, I'm just not informed about whether that family or members of that family actually coordinated or, or 
coordinated with the district attorney to watch the video. I was under the impression that at least part of the family may have, but I, I don't want to I, I don't want to be under oath and, and put that forward. Okay, thank you. And and I, I don't know if you can answer this question, but to Councilmember Lansman's point, do you have any idea whether or not a sample would have been provided to the family, or would they have been provided the entire footage? Do you have any idea? I I would imagine that it would be the family of of the individual would get to see the entire footage because this isn't. Uh, the, the public release, uh, it's, it's done for them out of, and that actually ingrained in, in the policy, in the public release policy, that before we release a video publicly, we will uh, contact either the individual depicted or the family involved and let them see it or at least offer for them to, um, to view it, uh, as well as the officers involved and the relevant stakeholders before of the public release. Okay, and I guess my final question uh, is going to be, again, I guess the, the concern still is, uh, you know, what, what is actually going to go out there? Um, who determines, well, I guess NYPD determines uh, the, the context and content of the footage that is being released, the context and content of uh, the subset or the sample? that is going to be released and to whom that information is going to. So uh, with the release of the footage in, in the policy, there are 30 days, I believe, um, upon release. Uh, why do you need 30 days to release footage of incidents that are of concern to the public? So I, I think maybe I should start with saying this, and I maybe should have answered this uh, in response to Council Member Lansman's questions, but I'll certainly say now that it, it does not benefit the NYPD to have a, a to release footage that somehow inaccurately depicts a situation of great public concern, only to have additional relevant footage come out a little while later and erode the trust that we're working so hard to rebuild with the community. So we are a very interested stakeholder in having a accurate representative sample and ultimately the full video released to the public. And But certainly if we're putting out a representative sample for whatever that reason is, maybe just the sheer volume or whatever that reason is, it does not benefit us to leave out vital information only to have that information become public at a later time. I mean, it's just, it just wouldn't make sense. So um, I hope that answered that question. I, I think you may have had another question that I'm forgetting. You, you got it in there, and, and, and I'm glad to hear you say that uh, because I think that there really, there, there should be transparency and really clarity on the whole matter. And again, I'm just going to end the way I started. It is imperative that the public has faith in this policy, uh, and I, I definitely share um, Councilmember Lansman's concerns um, with the way that the policy is currently drafted. So, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Followed by uh, Cohen, it would be Gibson. Uh, thank you, Chair Richards. Uh, you know, before I, uh, I ask questions, you know, I, I obviously I support my colleagues in. Uh, and pushing the department. I think that there is more work to do. But I, I do also want to say that in the time that I've been in the council, I mean, I think that we've made tremendous progress with this program started. Uh, you know, I've had the opportunity to view the view footage on occasion, and I feel like uh, we are making tremendous strides. Uh, in your testimony, uh, Oleg, am I getting terrible feedback? I, or is it just me? Are you getting feedback? Change, Change excuse me. <laughs> Take two. <laughs> That's better. Thank you. Um, you talked about uh, continuous being studied. Uh, when you say, is that a formal process? Or, or at Police Plaza, are there volumes of we studied this? What questions that you're asking? Could you elaborate on, on that? I mean, in, in terms of the uh, current policy, it, you're it's, you testified that you were studying the footage. Um, are you studying it in a systematic way? What are we studying for? Are there reports generated from these studies? Yeah. So we, oh, uh, we have a number of review processes that are in place. Uh, some are very structured and formalized, some are not. So uh, what was mentioned in the testimony earlier 
uh, was part of that process, and that is, is what we call a self-inspection. Uh, it's an inspection done at the command level uh, by individual sergeants. And what occurs is on a monthly basis, every sergeant who has cops, who have body cameras, are assigned to review five random sele randomly selected videos. I'm sorry, the sergeants are studying from their own command, though? Yes. And there is a worksheet that we have created that they have to use, and they have to answer very specific questions about whether or not the policy was complied with, the quality of the police service, whether or not there were any training or tactical issues observed, and then what, if any, follow-up was necessary. Uh, then, when the sergeant completes that inspection, it goes to their lieutenant. The lieutenant is then required to look at a sample of the reviews the sergeant did to make sure the sergeant got it right. And then quarterly, our risk management bureau takes those and looks at a sample of those to make sure they were done correctly. In addition to that, we have a number of other structured mechanisms in place to review uh, body camera usage and the, and the quality and the content uh, of the, the videos. So first, there is a weekly uh, roster that goes out to every command that we review, and this is a way to make sure we have every member of the service accounted for, make sure they have a camera. Uh, people are transferred, people come back from military service, people are promoted, so there are always a lot of changes and a lot of movement in the police department. So we have to make sure that when people show up in a command, they have a body camera, they have the right body camera, and, and they're properly equipped. Uh, we've also expanded who has the cameras. So currently, it's, it's all of patrol, uh, every precinct, transit district, and housing PSA. Uh, but in our uh, final phase of the rollout that began this March, we then expand, expanded that to the emergency services unit, highway patrol, uh, the strategic response group, uh, other specialized units that support patrol and perform patrol function. About 23,000 cameras in total. And in terms of the WHO, we've expanded from originally just police officers to then detectives on patrol, sergeants, lieutenants, and, and now we're almost finished equipping all uh, captains and above who command uh, those units so that they have cameras as well. So making sure everybody who is supposed to have a camera has a camera. We also look at usage, so we track uh, by borough, by command and citywide, uh, the number of videos per week, the number per tour, the average number of videos per police officer, uh, the correlation of the number of videos recorded in a precinct to the 911 call volume in that precinct. Uh, not that you can prove or demonstrate causation, but there is a correlation. And, and all of these uh, are done you know, by in and of themselves. They don't really prove anything, but over time you develop a baseline. Uh, so that you can identify anomalies. I'm sorry, is that a big part of what we're trying to do now, sort of establish a baseline? Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think we, we have a pretty good baseline right now. If we change the policy, then we'll look to see how changes occur. Uh, we also look at anybody who has uh, no videos in a, in a certain time period. Oftentimes, uh, there are legitimate reasons for that. The person was on vacation, the person was out sick. Uh, but as just a safeguard to make sure that if somebody is in a situation where they should be recording, they are in fact recording. So that's an added layer. Uh, we also look at aggregate data. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in the testimony, we're approaching almost 8 million videos. We're adding on average 130,000 videos each week. Uh, that's a lot of data. Uh, and you know, we, we look at other indicators that we have in the aggregate, like arrests, like summonses, uh, to can, I'm sorry, can I ask, can, what are some of the reasons you found that some people are recording a lot and some people aren't, other than, you know, you know not, not for vacation? Yeah, no, you know what, the, the averages hold up for most people, uh, and it depends upon the command, uh, depending upon the volume in, in a particular command, uh, 911 volume and, and crime and other activity, uh, the busier commands, we see it's an average of four videos per officer per day. Uh, in, in the less busy commands, it's an average of three videos per officer per day. They all average around eight and a half minutes each. Uh, that's, that's pretty consistent uh, across the city. Um, when we look at, uh, we, we've developed uh, basically scripts to uh, analyze certain data. Uh, it's, it's not an exact match. We have to make certain assumptions in terms of the time window to try to match up an arrest to a video. Uh, 
but we take uh, a big data analytical approach, we do get some false positives, some false negatives, but over time, again, we have a baseline. Uh, we have indicators, and where we see deficiencies, uh, we will investigate and address it. Uh, we also uh, incorporate body camera video into CompStat every week. So as part of the preparation for CompStat, the borough that's coming in, we look at their body camera compliance, we look at their usage, uh, we audit in every command uh, the supervisors in that command to see how many videos they're viewing uh, to make sure that in particular the training sergeants and the integrity control officers are reviewing video. Uh, also, if we see deficiencies in the sample that we pull, we will address it at CompStat. You know, something was not handled properly, uh, so there's that layer of review. We have other forums as well. We have a risk review uh, meeting which uh, identifies and, and looks at areas other than crime, but it's a CompStat-like format. We also have a force review uh, meeting, which is CompStat-like, where we look at use of force and investigations uh, into use of force, uh, and body cameras are a big part of that. So we do a very robust sampling of body cameras. We look at uh, to make sure the supervisors are reviewing the video. So we have this kind of multi-layered approach to reviewing video to ensure compliance and also assess the quality. I, I just have a couple more, but two of them are quick. Uh, one of the things I was concerned about initially in the rollout was, uh, I guess we're using SD, which I'm not sure what the difference is, what, what that stands for versus HD. Uh, do you think that we have any hope of getting HD? Do you think that SD has been a, uh, a negative in the program in terms of the quality of video? I, I have not seen it. Uh, we, we've, uh, in fact, uh, recently, um, well, maybe uh, um, nine months or a year ago, we did another round of testing where we compared, you know, standard definition is, is 480. We've looked at 720 and uh, as well as uh, um, 1080, uh, full high def. The differences are negligible. Uh, you, with, with the high def, you get better resolution of details in the background. But because most interactions are very, very up close, uh, there's really no significant difference. Uh, the difference would come on the other end in terms of cost because now we're doubling the amount of data that we have to store, and also moving that data across our network uh, could, could be a real problem. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, uploading the video through our network and into the uh, storage solution, uh, that would be an exponential increase in the amount of data. Could, could you just also talk about the occurrence of the camera falling off or how often that happens? It, it, it happens, uh, it, it, um, again, there are a lot of variables. Um, We've seen it uh, during a physical struggle where the camera breaks free. Um, we don't want them to be permanently attached. Uh, we, we want things to break free so that it can't be used as leverage and a weapon against an officer. Uh, I, I understand that concern, but it's of course, you know, it may be in those instances where the footage, footage is the, of the most value and we are potentially not getting it because uh, there, there is that concern. And, and I think Oleg even mentioned this early on, body cameras are not a panacea. Uh, and there are a lot of factors to be considered. You know, one body camera video sometimes is not enough. You've got to look at everybody who was on the scene, need multiple angles. Um, it's, um, you know, watching body camera video can be a little tough uh, because sometimes, uh, you know, unlike uh, a movie where you've got a director and a cinematographer, you're not always getting the best angle and the most salient point. Uh, you've got to go through a lot to, to put it all together and line it all up. Um, there is breakage. We do track that. Um, it's it's not a lot, uh, but it, it's consistent with, you know, clipping an electronic device onto your, your shirt. Okay. Uh, and just uh, lastly, I, I just going back to the uh, to the participation. I mean, are there instances of where individual officers sh have shown great resistance to to using the camera appropriately? Just speaking anecdotally. Uh, Early on, when we first began to roll out, uh, for, for a while I was attending every training session at the academy and talking to the cops, and uh, th there was some resistance. Um, you know, keep in mind that this is a, a huge paradigm shift um, for, for some people, especially you know, people of my age, uh, very unnatural to record or want to record myself. Uh, you know, I, I think what we've seen uh, up at the academy is that younger people who are very accustomed to Instagramming and very adept at social media, uh, more comfortable. So there's a bit of a learning curve. Uh, I think we're, we're well beyond that now, though. I mean, that was early on. 
uh, our, our training program uh, was unlike any other that we had seen around the country. Most police departments, 90 minutes of training, uh, basically here's the camera, here's the video management dashboard, here's how you use it, here's a copy of our policy. Uh, policies in most cases were rather limited. Uh, we spent a full day, uh, a lot of time talking about the policy, the must records, but also the benefits of recording, uh, how it can be useful in practicing, you know, actually doing role plays uh, to give cops that experience, that, that, that tactile feel of here's the camera, here's how it feels on your uniform, here's how it feels, and you know, get used to motioning to, to hit the switch. Um, so we invested a lot of time up front, and then that was buttressed by 90 days of field training back at their command. So we said, listen, we understand you're gonna make mistakes, it's okay. When you go back to your command, the next 90 days, uh, you'll be under the supervision and tutelage of your command training sergeant, who's gonna be looking at video and talking to you uh, and, and helping you to get it right and to troubleshoot. And that was a good way to, to kind of build up trust in the process uh, and get people used to it. Uh, we had brought all the training sergeants in uh, you know, prior to that uh, to, to give them a, a briefing on what was expected of them. And I think it worked overall very, very well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Councilmember Gibson, followed by Gibson Lander. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Um, oh, hold on. And we're also joined by Councilmember by Denise Miller. Okay. Could have Sorry. done it. Sorry. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for being here, and thank you to, to our chair and the public advocate and Councilmember Lansman for introducing the legislation related to body-worn cameras, um, simply for the committee and for the broader council to have more of an understanding of where we are in terms of BWCs, the rollout, some of the challenges that we face, and how we can continue to make the system better. Um, so I remember the pilot that started with 54 cameras and five commands. I remember when we started um, putting together an actual defined policy of how we roll out body-worn cameras. So I wanted to ask a few questions. And first, I start with the policy guidelines that the department came up with in April of 2017. In your testimony, you described a number of different organizations, advocacy groups, civil rights organizations that were a part of the conversation in terms of a body-worn camera working group, so to speak. So I guess my question is, now that that report has been released and we do have a framework of what the policies and guidelines are in using body-worn cameras, is this task force working group still meeting? Um, and are you still engaging actively with many of our community partners? So n not in a, in a formalized process. Um, you know, we've had the policy in, in place now since April of 2017. Uh, like, like any policy, especially something as important as this, we're looking at usage, we're learning lessons from situations that have occurred, uh, and, and we expect we'll, we will um, you know, make updates to the policy periodically. Uh, I expect that prior to publishing anything, we will do a round of outreach, uh, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Okay, so with the recent release of the policy guidelines on the actual release of body-worn camera footage, was there a, a dialogue or an engagement process with these same stakeholders before um, that policy was released? So not immediately prior to the publication of this policy in October, but this policy actually goes back to all the discussions around the original April 2017 policy. So in that policy, there is a general provision in there that body camera video can be released at the discretion and direction of the police commissioner. And when we go back before that, whether it was the stakeholder outreach or uh, the uh, general public outreach we did working with NYU back in 2016, uh, we did online surveys for the public and for police officers working with the NYU Law Policing Project and the NYU Marin Institute. Um, and we had over 30,000 responses from the public and over 5,000 responses from members of the department. That also helped frame how we think about this. And one of the things that we saw overwhelmingly you know, this, this interest in transparency, yes, uh, but then there's also concern about personal privacy and how we protect that as well. Uh, so that's what we've tried to balance. And at the time when the April 2017 policy went out, the, the thought process that the department goes through when considering 
when to release something uh, was not fully spelled out. So this October policy uh, looks to describe the process that the department and the police commissioner go through when thinking about one of these situations uh, when contemplating and preparing for public release. Now, early on, even though the 2017 policy did not lay out this thought process, uh, beginning in the fall of 2017 uh, through uh, May of 2018, we had four officer-involved shootings that were captured on body camera video. Not every mm -hmm. command had body cameras at the time. We were in the middle of the rollout. But we had four officer-involved shootings uh, where the officers were equipped with body cameras and did record the incidents. Uh, in all four of those cases, we released the body camera video from those incidents. And then in May of 2018, the PBA went to court, brought an action against us. Uh, the court issued an injunction. That injunction was in place until February of 2019, when ultimately the appellate division decided that body camera video was not a personnel record under 50A, and therefore the department could release it. So for that you know, almost a year time period, we had a big backlog of incidents and, and cases. So uh, this current policy was the first step in, in describing the process uh, that we think is appropriate to go through, conferring with stakeholders, conferring with the DA, who may be contemplating a criminal prosecution in some cases, making sure we let the officers involved know and the civilians and, and or their families uh, who depicted in the video know about the release, give them an opportunity to view video uh, before the actual uh, release occurs. So that was the genesis, and it's just really a continuation of a very, very long process. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's been a quite some time um, that has passed from February of 2017 to releasing um, this policy on the releasing of BWC. So I was just wondering what we've been doing in all of that time to make sure that all of the stakeholders are really engaged. So one of the examples that the public advocate and council member Adams have described was the police involved shooting at Hill House in the Bronx. Um, I know Hill House, it is in my former assembly district, and this is a building that is a supportive housing, a permanent housing building where there is a social services provider on site. So how does that play into the releasing of body camera footage when you have a, a social service organization that's on site with their own security cameras? Because that was a... Uh, it, it was a controversial issue that happened, and the family to this point has not really been engaged by law enforcement in terms of what happened to their loved one. But the social service provider on site um, has been working with the department and the DA's office. So I wonder, in cases involving a police-involved shooting in a residential unit that is a supportive housing, um, program, how do you work with that particular provider in getting information released, uh, not just to the department, but also to the family that's involved as well? So the way it's been done in the past when we have released the videos, uh, we've always worked through the district attorney's office because the district attorney will have their own investigation uh, in, into any police use of deadly force and we defer to them on this and they take the lead because generally they will be working with uh, the family and or the family's attorney. Uh, so in the prior cases, uh, that has been handled by the DA in this particular case. Uh, I can't speak to who exactly was conferred with, but I think your, your other point about uh, social service providers uh, is another factor to be considered when we talk about vulnerable populations in terms of what we release and when and, and who's involved. And that's one of those stakeholders that we would want to confer with prior to releasing uh, any video. Okay. And uh, my final question, I know time is of the essence. In terms of capacity and the presence of the storage of cameras, what happens when officers finish their tour and they place the camera in the docking station? Who has access to that and how are we working within the precinct to make sure that we have appropriate capacity as more officers are coming into commands and what's happening with the civilian staff that the department was going to hire that would oversee the management of cameras in our precincts? So, uh, yeah, uh, good questions, thank you. Uh, at, at the end of tour, when police officers come in, uh, they merely take their camera and just plug it into one of the receptacles in the docking stations that have been set up there. Everything else happens automatically. They don't have to do anything. All of the video will immediately begin to upload into the uh, 
cloud-based storage system, so it does not impact upon precinct operations. Uh, it's not competing with uh, server space for the, the precincts uh, um, functioning. So the, uh, other than all this data trafficking across our network, and we have a very, very large, capable fiber optic network in the NYPD, so we're able to move that uh, video uh, from every precinct and PSA and transit district pretty much simultaneously um, up into the cloud. Uh, there, there are mechanisms in place uh, where, where that flow can be controlled if there's like peak volume across the network. Uh, but our IT folks have done a great job uh, working with the vendor uh, to manage that process. So we have not seen any problems whatsoever with videos you know, not being uploaded or long delays. It, it does upload uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and then in every command, we've also established a priority docking station. So if um, the platoon comes in, you, you could have a large number of cameras being docked if for some reason, uh, for example, it involves an arrest and we have to get the video uploaded quickly so we can get it to the DA quickly, uh, that officer can dock that camera in the priority dock and, and that video will be uploaded first. And then in terms of the uh, civilian um, headcount, uh, so the uh, uh, increase in the headcount was authorized for uh, 97 additional civilian staff, uh, titles like media service technicians, uh, statisticians, analysts, uh, most of those are, uh, and some IT folks, uh, primarily split up between the Information Technology Bureau, the Legal Bureau, and the Risk Management Bureau, who are the folks primarily dealing with the day-to-day -day management of uh, body camera video. Um, I, th I think we're currently somewhere around uh, 60 or so people. Uh, there is some turnover, but we're constantly um, uh, soliciting uh, applications and hiring uh, uh, folks, especially the media service technicians. Okay, thank you. And I hope you'll work with us as it relates to the legislation that was introduced. I know uh, you have a position, but you know it's always subject to change. No, and I, 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 I had mentioned that to the public advocate at the end of my testimony that we're not opposed to reporting on body camera footage. It's just the structure of the bill. It doesn't take into account how the system currently functions. So the, I guess the cost and the resources to go into complying with the bill as written would be so great, um, but again, I offered to the public advocate and uh, to, to uh, Council Member Lanceman that uh, I will sit down and work with you all on developing some sort of a reporting bill that gives meaningful transparency into the process, into the data that we capture within the confines of the abilities of, of the system as it exists. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Before we go to Councilmember Lander, can you just, so would the department also be, because I know that um, uh, Councilmember Adams and Gibson mentioned and talk a lot about these families, and I know a public advocate mentioned that in his, uh, in his testimony. Would you be open to creating a liaison that will work directly with families impacted who may need to see body cam footage? I think um, as part of um, the Blue Ribbon Panel on Discipline, yep. uh, we one of the recommendations was to uh, appoint a liaison with individuals uh, in connection, of course, with disciplinary cases, but that's certainly something we could consider to leverage that individual. Uh, and again, this needs to be um, done in consultation with the district attorneys because sometimes right. the sensitivities involved but in I get the case. That, but yeah, but yeah. I, I think that's certainly something we can be open to looking at to see what we could do, yeah. So yes, you're open to doing that. So we're always open to new ideas, yes. Okay, all righty. Councilman Melander. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I, I want to pick up a little on the questions that Councilmember uh, Adams asked about the policy for family members in a situation where a loved one has been killed um, and they're working with an attorney or with advocates to be able to see the footage. Um, and I, I came in as those questions were being asked and answered, so I just want to make sure I understand. It sounds like you were sort of deferring to the district attorney there rather than just having a direct NYPD policy. Uh, of making footage available to family members to see within 24 hours or, or a reasonable period of time. Did I misunderstand that? I mean, w will you commit to allow families to see the footage with their advocates if they, if they want to? I, I mean, I think that's what this policy uh, assumes, 
that whether it's done with the DAs or through the DAs, whether it's done uh, through us, uh, that prior to a release of body cam footage that the relevant individuals are made aware, given, given some, some level it of access. It says they'll be made aware, but it, if it assumes that they can view it, then shouldn't it say that they can I view mean, it? That, again, that's, uh, I, I mean, that's something we could definitely talk about. I, I, think, no, I, I mean, I, we are talking I think, about right, it. I, I, I mean, want I a commitment that, to do it, I not think to that have a conversation was, about it. I think that was um, something that we have contemplated uh, with respect to families. I, I mean, I know we're parsing words, and that's fine. I mean, they, they, we did put out the policy, so the words should be parsed. But I, in terms of what our uh, assumption was and in, in what we were going to do is I think that was the assumption that whether it be through DAs or through um, us directly that but, this would but, be made available. But respectfully, I mean, if we were going to work on assumptions, we don't need a policy at all. Like, the policy but spells Ram, out... I was answering the question, and you were waiting but, to say if we're going to work on assumptions. The point that I'm trying to make to you is I, I am agreeing with you. I mean, I don't know if that came across, that um, whether it's done through the DAs or whether it's done through us directly, the intent is prior to a public release that whether it is the individual themselves depicted or a family member in certain cases of, uh, of an individual that's no longer with us to uh, have them see the video. Okay. And, but I mean, but you guys hold, I mean, I appreciate that. I appreciate that you're saying that family members and, and their advocates should be able to see it before it's released. So I, I appreciate that. I'd like to just make sure we get that into the policy so it's clear and family members know and 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 that can and so I'm not you keep saying I'm the DA and I'm just trying to understand there again like the policy should spell it out as I understand it this stuff is yours you hold it it belongs to you you're keeping it so it seems like the easiest thing is that you would have a policy that if a family member wanted to see it that they and their advocates could see it so what's what's the Barrier to, to, I mean, can't can I mean, we do that? I, if again, you say yes, we, we seem great. to be. I think we, we seem yes, to be wonderful. We seem to be agreeing, but we seem to be finding ways to try to make it sound like we're disagreeing. And what I'm saying is, is that the intent is to allow individuals, uh, relevant individuals, stakeholders, to be able to see it prior to release. Now, whether it is through us or whether it is through the district attorneys. But that does matter because the there's ten, five different district attorneys and a, right, and a and the, family. There shouldn't be five different policies. And so a family in the Bronx has different rights than a family in Brooklyn. And so the easiest thing would be if the NYPD would just, I mean, I agree with you. It's great you're saying we should do it. So let's just do it. Can't the, you know, will, will the NYPD establish a policy or adopt a policy that I think family the members I think the policy see? before you does that, uh, I mean, we, we seem to be it does do that. The like same families thing. Well, aren't... It, it does, at least from our interpretation of it. But uh, okay. all right. Well, how about how about the two families that I think the council member asked specifically about? I mean, for uh, Kowalski Trowick and Antonio Williams families, can can they just see the footage? Again, I think, and I answered this question. Maybe it was before you you came in that uh, I was under the impression that at least part of uh, one of the families. I don't know if the entire family, but had coordinated with the district attorney to watch, to see the video. And it's my uh, understanding that the district attorneys are like putting restrictions and conditions I on mean, who can I join. I, and again, I will look into it and get back to you on it. I, I don't, I'm under oath, so I don't want to guess and, at coming up with an answer, but I'll look into it and try to get back to you. Okay. I, and I, and I, I, it, I do appreciate that we're agreeing in spirit, but I think here the details matter. So I just I appreciate that you're going to get back to us, but I guess I, what I want to be clear is what, what, what I think should be the case, I won't speak for anybody else, is that rather than leaving it to the, in the hands of five different district attorneys, the NYPD, who's keeping this footage, should make it a policy, not an assumption, but an explicit written policy, that families and their advocates can see the footage, you know, at least before release, but you know, preferably within within a given time frame of it. And and there's every reason to do that. And I don't really understand anyway. So the, I, I hope you'll come back and say we'll make that part of our policy, and that you'll let these two families see the footage because it's, it's hard to feel like the assumptions are working if what we're hearing from family members is that they don't, they're, not, they're not getting to. Um, 
uh, and then just did I get right, I mean, uh, um, you guys continue to own and control and hold the, hold the footage, you know, just kind of permanently. Once it's with you, it's with you, and you guys are its, are its holders. Sure, it's a police record. Uh, I guess it, it would just stand to reason that we hold the footage, but there is a presumptive uh, destruction policy. I mean, obviously with carve-outs so that if it's needed in a criminal case, a civil case, it would be preserved beyond the uh, 18 months. But generally speaking, footage that doesn't fall into those categories gets over, overridden uh, after an 18-month period. And I mean, it's just my understanding, like I, I met with some folks from Doris, the Department of Records and Information Storage, you know, they're trying to balance the challenges of like, how do we make sure it gets preserved? How do we make sure the full range of independent people have access to it? Um, and I wonder if, you, if there was some consideration. And look, there's, here it is police records, 100%, and it's needed in police work. So I, I want you guys to have full unfettered access to it to be able to use it to address issues and solve crimes and figure out what happened. Um, you know, but in, in some instances, there winds up being a kind of a conflict of interest in various points of view of whose that is. And so we want, on the one hand, for the NYPD to have full, unfettered, appropriate, you know, confidential access. And on the other, for it to be available for full transparency. And I, you know, I think that's part of the challenge we're exploring here is kind of where does it sit? Who has it? How do we make sure everybody's got the right kind of unfettered and transparent access to it over time? But you, you, you think that, so did you consider other alternatives? Right, so I mean, I think it's, a, it's, I dedicated a paragraph of my testimony to list literally every agency that we consulted with in developing the policy. And as you can imagine, as a council member, elected official that deals with various stakeholders throughout hard, your day, hard. This you is hard. sometimes have positions that are just diametrically of opposed. Course. I mean, we have civil liberties union uh, uh, organizations that, didn't want us to hold they wanted uh, didn't want us to hold it more than 30 days or sometimes even less we had uh, deleted automatically unless there's an arrest versus people saying let's hold it for 75 years because it's a record so you know look it's so that's what we, i'm asking it, right so that, i mean that's so, the so let considerations let me, let me just, those are the considerations that we needed to take into account. That's why we had an open door. That's why we had a very diverse group of stakeholders come in and speak to us. That's why we looked at other departments throughout the country that are, and really internationally as well, that had rolled out this process before. And we came up with a retention period that balanced all of these interests. And it's, again, it's not written in stone because there could be preservation requests in the context of a civil matter, a criminal matter, um, uh, other matters where it becomes relevant and needs to be retained, then it's retained. Uh, but when there are none of these interests involved, then the retention period is 18 months. Understood. So let me just ask on, in terms of who you consulted, and I totally appreciate these are very difficult and perhaps irresolvable conflicts. And a lot of these situations are super challenging, and we've got different parties on different sides, and like that's why we're trying to make sure. So in so, terms of, yeah, in terms uh, of who civil we liberties and police uh, reform advocates spe specifically on kind of the retention and the policy yeah, questions. So with respect it. to who we consulted, Thank you. in developing the initial policy from 2017, uh, which got us today. We have police departments, Seattle, Washington, D.C., Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and the, uh, London's Metro Met Metropolitan Police. Then we also sought input from uh, the DA's offices, each of the institutional defense providers, and the administrators of the 18B panel, CCRB, the Office of Court Administration, the Public Advocate, the City Council, the New York Civil Liberties Union, the Center for Constitutional Rights, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Communities United for Police Reform, Inspector General's Office, Latino Justice, DEMOS, and the Citizens Crime Commission. I think that's a Pretty comprehensive list. Okay, that's a good list. Um, I, I guess I'm I'm not clear where you know there may be some place where there was a, a mismatch between some piece of it, but but we'll get back to you with that. So uh, I've I've gone on a while. I'm going to wrap up my questioning, but I guess what I'm going to say is this: on this issue of of the families, it does seem like in addition to getting back to us with an answer, 
just letting these two families and their advocates see the footage would go a long way to building confidence that the policies uh, that you're putting forward will work together with communities who are dealing with it. And yes, absolutely on the hardest of these cases, but like that's where we all get looked at for how these things work. I wish we could be judged by the easiest ones, um, but we're judged on the hardest ones, so it would be a big step forward if you could, if you could arrange for that as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, we're going to go to Public Advocate Jamani Williams, followed by uh, Jamani. We will hear from Councilmember Miller. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again for the testimony. And uh, I start off by saying I always appreciate these conversations with this administration, even though there's some disagreements. It's a lot easier than it was with the prior uh, uh, administration. Um, I know in the testimony you mentioned how difficult it might be as is. I assume there's going to be some negotiations. But I did want to know if you had a cost associated with the personnel you said was needed just to do um, the job if the bill passed as is. I mean, you, you know, and please, I'm under oath, so don't quote me to the penny on this, but I believe the cost of an analyst with fringe is somewhere in the $70,000 range annually in terms of a salary. So you multiply it out. When I did the rough uh, math here, we, I, what I basically did is I took the 136,000 videos, mm -hmm. multiplied it by eight minutes per video. That's the average per video. I got a total of minutes. I divided that by 60, which is 60 minutes in an hour. And then I had the total number of hours. Then I divided that number by 35, which is the work week in, in, you know, in, uh, for city employees. And I wound up getting somewhere around 497, right? So that's, uh, the assumption is, is that we would need to review, assuming the number stayed at 136,000 a week, we would have to review 136,000 videos a week, otherwise the backlog would result in us being late for the reporting. So if we get just purely watching videos and extrapolating the relevant data points just from watching, we get close to 500 employees. Then there are certain data points that require further research, further investigation. Uh, and that, w that is where the additional headcount would come up. And um, again, this is a rough estimate, and I'm assuming that we're using analysts and not police officers, but it's very costly. And the reality of it is, is that, as you've heard, we have a uh, a pretty comprehensive audit process that I think if we sit together or we sit together with your staff, I know you're probably a little busy, uh, we, can, we can take a look at what is the current audit process and extrapolate data from that process that's going to give you some meaningful info, insight. Like I said, in the testimony, we did a, a review of the last 28-day period in terms of compliance for turning the cameras on we're roughly at about a 93% compliance with respect to officers activating their camera. Now, we can't watch every video. It's just, it's impossible unless you, you hire an army of analysts. But what we could do is, and what we do do is these spot checks, these random audits, and we designate various people in the system. We have Risk Management Bureau, but that's more of a citywide, but then we have uh, sergeants in a, in a command. That, are, that have to review a certain amount of videos. Then their lieutenants have to review what they review. Then their patrol borough has to review what the lieutenants review. So, I appreciate that. I just, yeah. the, the quick math I did was about, for, for the numbers you said, was about $34 million for, for the analysts, okay. um, which sounds like I didn't like put a it lot. in dollars. I yeah. put, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot the, of money. The budget is about $5.6 billion. Just, well, just interestingly play. enough so that, you, you know, I, I know that number gets thrown around a lot, yeah. but about 90% of our budget is is salaries. I mean, it's not, it, 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 there Most is very, budget, yeah. right, there's very, very little discretionary money in that also, budget. Also, um, foundation funding that we don't, we don't actually have too much oversight over, but I know that's an additional amount on top of the 5.6. But I agree, I don't know if, the, if it's gonna go, you know, I do wanna sit down and figure it out, but I just wanna make sure there's a context uh, of what we're, what we're speaking about. Um, I think the spirit of what you're trying to get at Right. I, 
I think we can get there. We can take a look at the existing system. We could work together, and we can get there. You can, uh, I mean, we, we see it now. We do the audits now. I think working together, we can, we can certainly give m more transparency into a process that, I mean, we think is pretty transparent. That's the nature of body cameras is transparency. And just for clarity, and I know some of these questions might have been asked already, when does, how long does it take for CCRB to get it after an incident, the DA and Inspector General? So we have, um, with the district attorneys, a little different because there's the sharing portal. So once an arresting officer makes an arrest, they're able to upload their video into the portal and share it with the ADA that's prosecuting the case because they're generally doing arraignments within 24 hours, so they have this, they have this information. Uh, with respect to CCRB, uh, again, we had a backlog that we needed to work through because of the injunction on the release of, of body cam video. Uh, that injunction lasted for about a year and a half. So we worked through that backlog, the, that collection of, um, of, um, of video, and uh, we, uh, we also, um, just the sheer volume, as, as you noticed in my testimony, last year there were about 2,080 requests for video. We produced about just over 6,100 videos for their request. In 2019, we have so far this year, not a complete year, 3,700 about requests for video from CCRB, and so far we've produced 14,500 videos to CCRB. So as we expand the program and give more officers the body cameras, and as you know, multiple officers respond to the scene, you have multiple videos. Is so the turnaround time, uh, the turnaround time is, is we're getting a lot better, I think, by and large, we have a turnaround time of, with, of about 30 days or within, the, sometimes even shorter than that. In exceptional cases, it's a little longer than that. I mean, we have cases where there is 100 videos for one request, you know, just because of the event. But with that said, I, we're, we're continuously working with them and we're, I think we are working through how to streamline the process in order to get them these videos even faster than we've been able to streamline the process to do. And I think we're in a very good place and we expect the process to get significantly better and I think we, we will wind up uh, uh, eliminating the turnaround time or reducing it hopefully to a week to 10 days if, if possible. And what about um, the Inspector General? Uh, do you know the number? No, no requests. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, I'm being told that we haven't gotten any requests from them. But I'm, again, it would be. Uh, I'm sure the turnaround w would be significant. Would not be long. I did want to, and then uh, there's something up before my next question, and don't want to go back and forth. But I just want to make sure that I state. I know you said you uh, got input from and gave a list. I'm not sure how you define input and some of the other groups define input. I know that some of them may feel uh, that the groups you listed were not, the input was not significant in terms of the policy that was put out for the body world camera. So I just want to make sure I put that on the record and, and, and you have that in your mind as, as I, I, I appreciate it and I said and I, I, I think I was being pretty forthright about it right in the testimony as I listed everybody that we sought input from. I, my very next sentence did say that you know, a, a lot of the input that we received was uh, sometimes diametrically opposed. And ultimately, the idea was to hear all of the sides and to shape a policy that balanced all of the interests. So, I, I mean, I'm not sure how you got the input or how it went. I, I don't, there might be a disconnect there. That's all I'm saying that we can to kind of close that loop um, as, as we move forward. Yeah, just um, in, in terms of the process, yeah. so. When we went through this process, 2015, 2016, with all of the groups that Oleg mentioned, we shared with them a copy of our then draft procedure for body cameras, and then met with them in person and solicited their input. Also, uh, following up on that in 2016, uh, from June through August, working with the uh, NYU Law Policing Project and the NYU Marin Institute, we, uh, or they, uh, with our support, conducted online surveys. And they, uh, they put the uh, proposed policy online, and then they asked a series of questions. We had over 30,000 public responses to the survey. Uh, NYU consolidated all of that and issued a report. 
Uh, we also did a survey for police officers. Again, same thing, uh, NYU put the proposed policy online, uh, invited police officers that we provided the, uh, the emails to, uh, to participate. We had uh, 5,000 responses uh, to that as well. Uh, the NYU report, and, and then uh, we wrote a final report describing that process, describing the policy, and describing the decisions that we made uh, where we agreed, where we disagreed, and why we made the decisions that we made. And, and that was posted and is still posted on the NYPD website. Thank you. Um, can I get the, the, the logic of why we can't share the footage to the families unless we go to the DA? Can you understand the logic that the NYPD has? I mean, I, I don't think it's unless. I, I don't think that, that was the idea. I think it's just oftentimes, given the, the sensitivities of, of the event, that that's just the, the, way, the way it plays out. But it's, it's not saying just. We're not saying just. And we're, we're certainly, if we're looking at ways of sharing, I mean, whether it's through us directly or through the DAs, it's just that given the sensitivities of certain of these events, when you're sharing video with families, uh, it's been done through them in, in, well, in cases. Well, for sake of this discussion, I just want to, the argument of why NYPD can't just share it. So why can't NYPD just share it with the families? I mean, again, like I said, it's, it, it, I, I think it's more about the sensitivities involved. If you have a police-involved shooting and you're showing the video of that shooting to a family, it's sometimes m maybe better to do it through a district attorney's office. Uh, we're not necessarily saying it can't be done through us. Uh, or are police officers who and are again, as the chief mentioned to me, sometimes is the family's preference to have it done through a third party and not directly through us. So, but like I'm saying, I think it's it's more about the sensitivities involved in in such an incident than uh, than saying that it's we're precluded from doing it. We're not precluded from doing it. We're are, just trying to do it in the most sensitive way. Are police officers who are involved or any of their agents allowed to see the footage? Yeah, prior to release. Yes. Uh, is that right? Yeah. yeah so in, in the past, and, and you know, again, I think it's important to keep in mind for about a year, there was an injunction against the police department. So for that whole time period, we could not release anything until the uh, uh, court decision uh, ruled in our favor. Uh, but when we uh, did release prior to the injunction, uh, we made the video available to uh, the civilians uh, involved and or their families and attorneys. Uh, and we also made uh, viewing available to the police officers involved uh, just prior to release. You know, we, if they're going to see it on the 6 o'clock news, uh, better that they um, see it, you know, beforehand, uh, before it actually goes public, around the same time the family had access to it. So but what I'm saying, generally speaking, police, also, police officers have, have access. I'm not talking about the ones that in the past and ones moving forward. Police officers and or their agents would have access to the footage but I'm trying to understand the logic of, if it's sensitive, why do they have access, but the families would not? So they, they do not. Uh, it, it, in general terms, police officers and their supervisors have access to body camera footage. It's just a necessity of day-to-day -day operations. We need police officers to be able to share the footage to a DA. We but want let me, them. I just want to be clear, you said they don't, but now you say right. they do. So for, in general, they do okay. for routine situations. When there is a critical incident, like a police-involved shooting, uh, immediately we have a supervisor collect all the body cameras. Uh, all the cameras are turned over to our force investigation division. They will upload the video and lock out the video so that nobody can see the video except for a handful of people in the department, internal affairs, force investigation, uh, a few people in legal uh, who have access to locked out videos. So during the course of an investigation over a critical matter, uh, we have the ability, and we do, immediately secure that video, uh, lock down the video so that nobody can view it uh, until we deem it appropriate. Um, all right, and I, I, have a, I have to leave. Unfortunately, I do have a bunch of other questions that I'm hoping we can talk uh, as we move forward. Uh, they do center around this. I, I do think just families should have access sooner than everybody, that, that seems to make sense to me. We seem to be behind in, in other municipalities and how we release the footage. I'm hoping um, we can speed that up. I know in terms of what was released, I know we're gonna 
try to work it out, but I know there's a feeling that uh, the procedures now seem to err toward helping the department and not necessarily the transparency of the um, public. That's just a feeling now, so we're trying to figure out ways how to make that feeling um, be less. One of them, I think, would be getting a better understanding of critical incident, because there's things like gender-based violence and other, um, other incidences that may not fall under that category now. Uh, in addition, if we can come up with a, another party um, that is also involved in the auditing in the auditing process and reviewing it, whether it's Inspector General or someone else that uh, will the give federal the federal monitor does. Okay. So th there is there is okay. that as well. Yeah. Um, so those are just the the, the areas that I want to have uh, s some more discussions as we move forward. But I appreciate this and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Um, so uh, I, I obviously just just about everything that could be asked on this subject matter has been asked, but I, I would just like to get a little clarification on on kind of the, just the intricacies of, and, and particularly what the public advocate had just asked and, and, and the members before. It is just a, a, a about the, whether or not the access to, to the footage is, is equitable. And that means in terms of timing, in terms of when, where, how, and, 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 and things of that nature, and, and, and who that is, whether it is, it is family, it is the district attorney, it is defense, it is the police department. Um, those, does everybody have equal access? And if not, what are we doing to work towards um, that um, equity? So I, I, think, uh, I think the access is equal. So in terms of, for example, in the policy prior to release, prior to public release, uh, it lists under in that section who will be notified of the release, which includes both the officers involved, the families. Uh, there's going to there would be an opportunity uh, to see those videos. Uh, they they all fall under one one section. Now the district attorneys, I don't know if we want to call it inequitable, but as the prosecutors, they would have access to that footage because they're the prosecutors, so they almost immediately have access to that footage. And in, the, in terms of, I think, of police-involved shooting of, uh, of an unarmed civilian, the attorney general would have almost immediate footage because, because they're, they're the prosecutors. So I wouldn't necessarily call it inequitable. I think it's just a function of, of what their function is. So, but police officers, family members, individuals depicted, uh, they're put into that same category if you look at the policy. So there is equity there. So w what happens if it's not a police-involved shooting and district attorney has it? Does they have, do they have a responsibility based on policy to turn it over immediately to defense attorneys? And Absolutely. So, you know, I, I can talk currently under the discovery laws as they stand today. I really, I don't know if we want to waste time on that because in about a month and a half, the discovery laws change. So I'll just talk about what's going to be the case in six weeks. So in six weeks, the body worn camera footage that we provide to the district attorneys will be provided by the district attorneys to the defense. As a matter of discovery. As a matter of discovery. What does it look like days. today? Uh, the, the prosecutors turn over uh, discovery. There isn't a set deadline. It has to be done before trial, which I think was part of the catalyst to why uh, uh, many advocates advocated for reform, that they didn't think the turnover of that information to the de defense happened expeditiously enough, so uh, time frames were put in place. So with that said, um, currently, and the law that's about to sunset and, and be overridden is that the DAs have it and need to provide it to the defense prior to trial. As of January 1st, the DAs would have to provide it to the defense right. within, 50, uh, within 15 days from arraignment, which is an arraignment happened as you know, within 24 hours. So setting, setting, setting aside new state law uh, addressing the issue of discovery, uh, talking about families and still talking about district attorneys, CCRB. Um, is there a process in place to make sure that 
if it's more equitable in how this ha how this information is distributed. Uh, meaning to families? Because obviously discovery is going to take care of the other piece on the, on the defense side, but it's still families, it's still CCRB and maybe others uh, that involved. Sure. How, how do we make sure that? So that with, I, I mean, since we started talking about discovery, uh, so let's, I'll, I'll talk about that first. I think that uh, many times uh, that because of the shortened time frame of 15 days, that a uh, individual that's the subject of arrest will likely have that footage fairly quickly under the new system. Now, in the case of a uh, um, uh, family, if you have a de deceased individual and you have a family, uh, in that case, again, the DAs would have that, assuming there there is no prosecution there. Whether there have been families, as I've mentioned, that have shown a preference because of the sensitivities involved to have, uh, to not have us show them the video, to have it done through a third party, in that case is the DA's office. Mm -hmm. But one way or the other, the idea is and the intent is, is prior to any public release to allow the families or the individual depicted to, to see the footage. With respect to CCRB, we have already significantly reduced the turnaround time. There are cases where it's under 30 days, 30 days generally is kind of the rule of thumb. With that said, we're actively working with CCRB to even shorten the time frames that we've been able to reduce it to now. And I think we're in a good place and we're making significant progress. Let's talk a little bit about the audit process. How, how likely is it that each orf officer that is charged with a body worn camera or, or supervisor um, will be touched in some shape, form or fashion whether by the audit or outside of the audit process that, that um, the information that is captured would be reviewed in some semblance during the course of a year? So um, d I, the, the chief will go into, uh, I think with a lot more detail, he's more knowledgeable about the, the process, but we did put in audit processes in place, so I'll, I'll Wing, I'll, I'll do my best here, and you correct me if I'm leaving something out, that every precinct obviously has police officers and has a number of sergeants that can directly supervise those officers. Sergeants are required, each sergeant in a precinct is required to view a certain amount of videos, and then the lieutenant that oversees the sergeant and the cops will then view to see what the sergeant is doing to make sure they're doing it. And On at the end of, of that process, how many people were actually touched? Is, is the question. Uh, what's the... Uh, what, what is the percentage? The is, is it like random drug testing? Uh, no. How do we do that? How do we come up with This is more that? systematic. Uh, so with the selection, you know, each sergeant supervises on average eight to ten people. Uh, they're being, they have to look at five videos per month, uh, compound that over 12 months. Their lieutenant is then looking at a sample of the videos they looked at to make sure they did an adequate review. We have a number of other processes in place that look at data and, and use data to compare, uh, to, to look at, so for example, volume, number of videos recorded, uh, average number of videos per police officer, average uh, length of video, so that if we have outliers, that would then trigger a review, why is this person an outlier? We look every month for a 28-day period, any police officer with zero videos during that 28-day period. Then we in investigate each one, why doesn't this person have a video? And uh, almost every time, there are legitimate reasons. The person was on vacation, they were out sick, they have an administrative assignment, they don't go on patrol. Uh, but that is looked at. Uh, so it, and then in addition to usage, uh, we compare, we have designed algorithms to look at data. And we look at data from body camera videos and we compare it to other data sets that we have to make matches for arrests and summonses and things like that. It's not a perfect system. We do get some false positives and some false negatives because it is a quantitative approach. Uh, but then where we do see red flags and anomalies, we will then look further uh, to identify why those anomalies exist. Uh, we also, as part of uh, CompStat Force Review uh, and our Risks Review, which is uh, CompStat for other things in the police department other than crime, we're looking at body camera usage and compliance. Uh, every week we look at uh, one borough and we look at, uh, we do an audit of the supervisors in each command. 
to look at how many videos they're looking at. We then look at a sample of their videos. Uh, we do then a weekly conference call with each borough, uh, and we go over the results of the review of the body camera video and the reviewing by supervisors. So it's a multi-layered approach, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, but it's a long way of saying that through the course of a year, uh, on some level, we're touching almost everybody. And then I just just add to that, and then yeah, we have the, the federal mm -hmm. monitor also does a review as well, which is outside of the department as part of the 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 um, the federal court decision. So because he kind of get, began the statement by giving a, a a really low number, which which would suggest that everybody's not going to be touched. But then when we talk about the different processes. Um, the possibility becomes that, and that's exactly what we're talking about. What are we looking for? What 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 what, what is what are being asked? What are, what are the algorithms that that kind of set off uh, th these audits? And and um, at the end of the day, are they being reassessed and evaluated so that um, we're, we're capturing not, not just capturing the target audience, but uh, in cases of discipline, that that we, we always want to be better. Uh, absolutely, right? and, and are, we, are, are we evaluating that? And and what have we seen thus far um, that has either removed uh, something from the process or added additional uh, algorithms or questions to the process um, that will make it more efficient as we move forward? You know, we we've continued to expand this process. Uh, you know, it began with uh, simple sampling, and, and then over time we've developed, uh, the, the, like I said, this big data approach. Uh, we've added layers of review. We've added, uh, we incorporated the CompStat now to make sure uh, we're looking at, uh, every week looking at body camera video for the people coming into CompStat, and if we see deficiencies, we're raising it at CompStat. Uh, so it's being addressed uh, through multiple forms. Also, quite frankly, through every investigation. Uh, if there's an allegation, if internal affairs or somebody else is looking at something, uh, the first thing we look for is body camera video. So, and, and, then, and then finally, I know there was a question about how this was being perceived uh, and, re and, and what was the response of rank and file. Obviously, PDA felt a way about it, but as we've moved beyond that, has it become a tool? Um, do they see it as a tool, a resource, and has the department uh, how much uh, are we, how much as a department are, are, are you viewing it as a tool, a resource for training, reinstruction, and if, if, in, if in fact, what have you learned that it now is providing reinstruction for, for whatever the, the initial instruction on the rollout was, what are we doing differently, and is there something that, that you've learned that is now being taught or instructed to the, the entire uh, workforce over there. So I, I think one of uh, the trajectory that this has followed is kind of what we expected and what was some of the police departments, that initially when we rolled it out, there was some skepticism. Uh, it was a significant paradigm shift from what policing had been. Uh, for many of us, kind of unnatural to wear a recording device and, and record ourselves all the time. Also saw something of a generational divide you know, people of my generation a little more reluctant based upon some of the feedback we got early on in training, but many of the younger cops coming on who were very adept at and accustomed to social media and, you know, various uh, uh, streaming uh, forms, uh, very adept at it and, and embraced it rather quickly. You, you know, now uh, the, the feedback we get and what we see, even just anecdotally, uh, cops have, uh, for the most part, fully embraced it, appreciate it. Uh, like having the camera. Uh, I know we value it institutionally uh, because of the value uh, conducting an investigation, uh, conduct, looking at an allegation. Uh, the training value is incredible. Uh, you know, we can talk about an idea, a concept in a classroom, uh, or we can show some real life videos. And it's very, very impactful. So we have incorporated body camera training into recruit training, uh, in-service training, uh, and, and now we're putting out a series of tactical training videos that uses body camera video. So very, very powerful. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I know we're gonna, the public is anxious to testify. Just had a few um, last questions. Let's just staying on the topic of auditing. 
Um, would the NYPD support a bill requiring you to report on your auditing process and the results of those audits? As I, as I said, you know, we, I think the right approach is that we sit down together and figure out what the common sense approach is to report on body camera footage. I'm not going to say no to you. I mean, I think that, you know, the bill, this particular bill is written, it just, it simply can't be complied with on, on, unless you're willing to fund hundreds of employees for the sole purpose of watching videos to provide these data points. With that said, I think the spirit of the bill is very clear, and I think what we can do is sit around the table, take a look at how the system works, what data we capture, how we do our auditing, and then build a reporting mechanism around that, that first, it's not gonna cost a lot of money at all, and second, it's gonna actually give the public and, your, and yourselves much greater transparency. Uh, thank you, Oleg. And then, um, if you can go into, you said, uh, you mo just through the monitoring, sergeants obviously monitor the system in each precinct, correct? Um, what well, a body camera footage, right? randomly. Uh, so if there are particular uh, officers who, whether through informal or formal complaints, um, seem to be increasing, uh, would the sergeant then monitor their body camera so footage a little closer? Absolutely. Or? So that's something okay. we've incorporated into our monitoring program. So we have a, a performance monitoring unit uh, that looks at tracks at-risk employees. We have a whole monitoring program with different levels of monitoring requiring different levels of supervision uh, that also impose different types of restrictions and conditions upon an individual member of the service. Uh, that now incorporates review of body camera video and it's also something we do when we uh, at the force review process when we look at civilian complaints that are force related. Uh, we also look uh, at some of the body camera videos, but we also look to see if the supervisors in that command are looking at that individual's body camera video on a regular basis. And now, then if not, not those are the local supervisors. Is that information translated up to one PP, or is it? Well, that, that's kept where at the local we do level. force review. Okay. It's it's uh, shared by either the first not just use of force, myself. but any incidents uh, where there seem to be. All right. Performance monitoring is part of the Risk Management Bureau that sits above okay. all the operational commands. That's not being delegated solely to the local level, although we do want supervisors on the local level to be engaged, look at these videos, uh, and, and be plugged into that process. Okay. So we're looking to make sure they do it, but we're doing it at, at other levels also. Okay. And then you uh, mentioned uh, particular officers who could have zero um, video footage for, for a month or so. How many cases of that have we ever seen? Have we seen so far? Oh, every, every month we have officers with no videos, but- On uh, average, how many? It depends upon the command. So in, in some of the smaller commands, it, it can be a very, very small number. In, in some of the very, very large commands, uh, it, it could be as many as 40 in some cases we've seen, but it doesn't mean they did anything wrong. When we look at it, we find out that they're assigned to a community affairs function, or they, are, they work in crime analysis, or they uh, are exclusively administrative, or they've been out sick or on vacation. Okay. Uh, what we're looking for is to identify a subset to make sure that uh, if there's anybody who's on patrol engaging in enforcement activity, that they are in fact recording. Okay. And, and you know we do that, and once we started doing that, we put the word out that we were doing it, so we haven't seen problems, uh, but it's because we do this audit. And what is the, uh, what are the consequences for an officer not turning on their body camera? It, it depends upon the facts and circumstances of the situation. Uh, you know, there are situations where uh, something could happen spontaneously. You know, you turn a corner and something's going on in front of you, you jump out to intervene. In our training and in our policy, we say activate your camera as soon as practicable. Uh, you know, that will be fact uh, dependent. Uh, sometimes there, there, there could be a good natured mistake, a uh, good faith mistake. Uh, it, so we have to evaluate those. But, we, you know, we have, uh, uh, and then there's also the field training period, the first 90 days after an officer receives their camera, uh, it's expected they're going to make mistakes because they're not used to it. So initially, during that field training period, 
Uh, we expect that there be direct supervision and instruction from a supervisor uh, and, and verbal admonishment. Uh, beyond that, then we get into more formal discipline where either it's a, a supervisor's uh, assessment entry uh, into the app that we have for uh, documenting um, you know, some failure to, to do something you're supposed to, to a more formal command discipline uh, with some penalty of time. Uh, and then we've seen more extreme cases where we've had some serious misconduct that has resulted in, in much more significant uh, penalties. And in, mis and in those severe cases, what would happen? It, it depends upon the facts and circumstances. Can you of describe what, the what a severe was. instance is? Um, not without revealing uh, anything that's too identifying. Uh, we, we've had prohibited recordings uh, that have resulted in, in formal discipline. Uh, we've had um, um, inappropriate actions that have resulted in formal discipline, uh, discourtesy that has resulted in, in more serious formal discipline. Okay. All right, you know my history and sort of where I think the NYPD has not necessarily done as much as they can ensuring that discipline is really um, delved out in appropriate ways, and I know we're, we're working through that. Uh, that's why we want a discipline matrix as well so that there's a standard and everybody certainly is following one standard. Um, so I'm hoping that those who, you know, and we all are human, um, may make mistakes or certainly sent back to be retrained um, so that they're not making that mistake uh, too often or at, or at all. Um, and then I'm assuming technologies will, God willing, get better. I mean, we all have Siri on our phone, right? Everybody knows Siri or Alexa? So I'm hoping that the technologies will evolve and we certainly won't have to necessarily have to physically turn it on, but God willing, technology is well evolved there. I, the last question is just on level one stops. Um, so I know that there's currently a, a judge who's um, uh, having you pilot a level one stop, correct? So this is part of the monitorship. Right. Judge Torres mm -hmm. has issued an order to conduct a pilot. Uh, the question is, and, and just, uh, you know, a level one encounter, it, uh, that's a term that goes back to a 1976 New York State Court of Appeals case, People v. DeBoer. And what the court was trying to get at was police civilian encounters that were not an arrest or a stop, uh, but some lower level of intrusion. And uh, the plaintiffs have con expressed some concern that people could misinterpret something as a level one that's really a stop and should be treated as a stop and doesn't meet the legal threshold. So the purpose of this pilot is to get a sense of are there other interactions out there that really rise to the level of a stop or maybe even an arrest uh, but just aren't being treated that way. And just to put it in context, a level one encounter is any time a police officer talks to a civilian and is seeking information from that person. So if, if, if I approach, if I respond to a 911 call and I'm approaching, you know, your building and you're, you're sitting outside and as I, I come in, uh, I ask you if you call the police. I'm, I'm speaking to you and I'm requesting information from you. That's, that's a level one encounter as the New York State Court of Appeals has defined it. It's the lowest level of police intrusion with a civilian. Uh, there are a lot of public safety type level ones, you know, for example, if we're searching for a lost child and I have a photograph of the child and I walk up to people in a park asking, have you seen this child? Those are all level one encounters, right? I'm a police officer, I'm acting in my official capacity. I approach you and I ask you a question and I'm seeking information from you. Um, you know, that's more than hello, how are you today? So it, it's, you know, we have some concerns around uh, the level one, uh, documenting level ones because, uh, um, you know, many of these are public service functions. Uh, and, and this can be, you know, very invasive and very intrusive. Uh, sick people, somebody's laying unconscious in the street, I come over, hey, are you okay, what happened, do you need help? Uh, that's a level one. So uh, the goal here is for the monitor to conduct a pilot, we're hoping to begin it in the spring, to look at different ways of documenting or capturing level one encounters to see whether or not 
uh, more work in that area needs to be done, whether or not some of these are in fact being treated as stops, even though the legal requisite for a stop isn't there, uh, and then to make recommendations and go from there. So we're currently exploring with the monitor different ways to do that, whether it's paper documentation or just expanding what we record. However, as we started out today, we talked about, uh, and, and you know, thinking back to the ACLU 2004 report that talked about just the, the intrusive nature of body cameras in the first place. And, and once that video is there, if it is accessible, if it is foilable, uh, we're, we're revealing a lot of very private information about people's lives in their homes. So th there is that tension, and that's what we're looking to work out. And, and the policy uh, is designed to consider all those things. And then ultimately, Judge Torres will make a decision on what she wants to do next after the results are in from that experiment. Right. And I'll just add on, on um, you know, those level ones, that, that low-level intrusion also has built mistrusts with communities as well through certain interactions. So I'm hoping that after this pilot is done that we're certainly going to reevaluate it. One uh, example of that is DWB. Everybody knows what that is? Driving while black. And, um, and this is why I didn't support the second half of the community, what, what, I forgot the bill, Community Safety Act for that specific reason as, you know, someone whose constituents have certainly experienced that you know, it's certainly something that we're interested in having a lot more conversations ar around as well. Um, with that being said, thank you both for coming today. We look forward to continuing to work with you to uh, build on the foundation. We do commend you for taking some big steps, so I don't want you to leave here feeling as if we're, um, you know, not happy at the, with the direction we're headed in, but there's still a whole lot more work that needs to be done to make sure that uh, this body camera program is working the way it's intended to, and that's to ensure that the public has the ultimate trust and in interactions between the police department uh, and the public. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, thank you. All right, next panel. Michael Sadzitsky, New York Civi C Civil Liberties Union, Laura Heck, Rabella, Brennan Center of Justice for Justice, sorry from chopping your names up. Jacqueline Corana, Brooklyn Defender Services. Stephen Wasserman, Legal Aid Society. Lenora East of the Bronx Defenders. So Michael Sazitsky, New York Civil Liberties Union, Laura Heck Rabella, Brennan Center for Justice, Jacqueline Karuna, Brooklyn Defender Services, Stephen Wasserman, Legal Aid Society, Lenora Easter, Bronx Defenders. you may begin. Ladies first. Wait, hold on. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Stephen Wasserman uh, with the Legal Aid Society. I represent the Legal Aid Society and our class action plaintiffs in the federal monitoring process. Uh, I am also reviewing the body-worn camera footage that we receive in conjunction with pretrial discovery. Uh, I mean, you've already had, I think, a very exhaustive description uh, of the program. Uh, I would like to call attention to three concerns uh, that we have uh, already witnessed. 
Uh, one having to do with the quality of the body-worn camera footage that we're receiving in discovery, and uh, secondly, uh, the problems that we anticipate with, uh, with the timing of discovery uh, once the uh, new discovery statute comes into effect uh, about six weeks from now. Uh, you know, first of all, um, we, we have a large body of tangible evidence of under-recording. Um, we have dozens of useless body cam recordings provided by the NYPD in connection with pretrial discovery. Uh, recordings which typically begin with an image of a suspect who was already under arrest and in handcuffs. Uh, if the camera had been properly activated, uh, which would give you that, that one minute buffer on, on the Axon cameras, um, these recordings, which include both pedestrian and automobile stops, should have contained the observations that led the police to stop, approach, and question uh, the defendants. Uh, the truncated recordings, which we are getting in very large numbers, they are of no evidentiary value, um, and they result from a willful failure by some patrol officers to activate their cameras or to press the record button uh, in time to show what they saw and, and how they responded. Uh, uh, I guess it's a very costly program, and uh, I, I think it, it is going to be very important uh, to, uh, to encourage the, the patrol officers uh, to, uh, uh, to activate their cameras in, in time to, uh, 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 to obtain recordings uh, which are of any value in showing compliance with the Fourth Amendment. Um, th that said, uh, we anticipate uh, some major problems uh, with pretrial discovery. Uh, the uh, routine time for disclosure uh, of the body-worn camera footage would be within 15 days of arraignment, uh, but that is extendable uh, at the behest of the district attorney. Keep going, keep going. Is, is that, oh. Keep going. I, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, that is extendable at the behest of the district attorney. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a, a deadline, uh, and this is not an extendable deadline, uh, that, that every accused uh, who has been offered a negotiated plea uh, is supposed to receive the body cam recordings three days in advance of, of entering that plea and, and being sentenced. Uh, this is a particularly important feature of the new discovery law. Uh, it will mean uh, that Fourth Amendment violations uh, are not going to be masked or are not going to be uh, overlooked uh, as a result of, of pleas. I mean, very often we, we are offered, you know, very generous and lenient pleas. Uh, and, of course, we're giving up our Fourth Amendment rights in connection with that. Uh, but at least under the new discovery statute, we're entitled to see the encounter. We're entitled to know what we're giving up. Uh, we think uh, there is a very low probability uh, that the police and or the DA uh, is going to be able to comply with the new discovery statute. Uh, the, the police are going to give the DA the body-worn camera footage in an unredacted form. We are not going to get it in an unredacted form. It is not altogether clear who's going to be responsible for doing those redactions. Uh, I, I, um, I, I think at the very least they're, uh, they're going to need a, a lot more resources uh, in order to comply with state law. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Caruana. I'm a senior attorney with Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, I want to thank uh, Chairperson Donovan Richards and other members of the committee for um, allowing us to speak today. Um, I want to start by addressing some of the testimony from the representatives of, of NYPD that we just heard about in regards to extending the buffering period to mirror cities like Washington, D.C., where it's two minutes. I know um, Councilmember Richards did ask about that. Um, 
I believe that NYPD's position was that they haven't seen situations where it would be helpful to extend it back. Um, the majority of the footage that we see in Brooklyn has a 30 second buffering period. So this other camera that has the one minute, we're not seeing very many of those. Um, the majority of them have this 30 second buffering period. And the officers are trained on this 30 second buffering period, which means that they're aware that this 30 second period exists prior to them pushing the button. And it's not that difficult for them to count back 30 seconds before pushing the button. Um, and the reason why it would be helpful to extend that buffering period uh, to at least two minutes is because it reveals police misconduct. And I want to give you an example of a case that, um, of a client that we had in our office where this is extremely on point, this buffering period. Um, the client that we represented was on his way home from picking up dinner for his family when his car was stopped by an NYPD officer. The officer had recently been outfitted with the new body-worn camera, meaning I'm assuming that's the one that has the one minute um, buffering period as opposed to the 30 second one. He had been recently outfitted with that one and he was unaware that he had been outfitted with a different camera that had a longer buffering period. And he began record, so the, his body camera began re recording one minute prior to the manual activation rather than the previous 30 second period. When that footage started, the footage that we received, it was clear that the officer is seen placing a weapon in the glove compartment of our client's car. He's then seen waiting before activating the camera, so actually mentally counting the 30 second uh, buffering period. And he then goes back into the, he, he then turns on the camera, goes back into the glove compartment of our client's car and pretends to discover the weapon that he had placed there. Our client was arrested, charged with possession of that weapon, which he adamantly denied during the several months, uh, during the entire pendency of his case. The body camera footage was turned over, but not for several months after his initial arraignment. And the case was then dismissed after the defense attorney pointed out that the obvious planting of the, of the evidence to the district attorney on the case. That officer is still employed by NYPD. I believe that the representative from NYPD said that they were concerned <coughs> primarily about protecting the privacy of the public in regards to this rollback or this buffering period. And it, to me, it's clear that they're concerned about protecting officers who are committing misconduct. Um, that two minute period that they have in Washington DC would certainly capture more police officer misconduct than the 30 second time period that they're utilizing today. Um, additionally, I also want to point out that the representatives from NYPD testified that they did an, an audit of a sample of body camera footage um, to determine whether or not the, the cameras were turned on when mandated by the patrol guide, um, which for the most part is at the beginning of the police citizen encounter, um, not at the time of arrest. And just as you heard from my colleague, um, what we are seeing, the majority of what we are seeing in the body camera footage that we get, the body cameras are actually um, activated at the time of arrest. And the, um, the statistic that was given by the NYPD representative was that 92% of what the, the footage they're auditing is in compliance with the patrol guide. <coughs> so either that audit is capturing a very significantly skewed data sample or that calculation is just simply inaccurate. Um, and I do want to just give one more example of how this comes into play when we're dealing with the body camera footage not being turned on until the time of arrest. Um, and this is an individual that I represented for almost two years. Um, in his particular situation, he was walking home um, at night from a local deli with his sister. And further up the block, there were two other individuals who were in a fight in the middle of the street. Um, the police officer in this case had observed this fight. He then, um, also said that he observed someone throwing a firearm on the ground. And that police officer gets out of his car with his gun drawn. The two people in the fight take off running and my client and his sister remain standing where they are on the sidewalk. The police officer points his gun at my client, tells him to put his hands up, which he did. The police officer then physically walks my client over to a nearby fence and handcuffs him. It's at that point that the body camera footage is turned on. The only reason why we know about any of what happened prior was this 30 second buffering period. But nothing was captured about this fight. 
Um, it's clear that he didn't even turn on the body camera at the time that he drew his service weapon when he exited the vehicle. At the very least, the patrol guy would mandate that. Um, and so what ends up happening is that my client is arrested and charged with possession of this firearm that's found in the middle of the street. And the officer claims that prior to this body cam footage re being recorded, that he observed my client throw it on the ground. My client voluntarily submits a DNA sample. His DNA is excluded from an almost full profile that was actually recovered from the firearm on the ground. Um, so clearly his DNA is not on the firearm. And through almost two years of defending him and litigating this case, the district attorney's office refused to dismiss the case. They did come down significantly in their offer. But I, and the reason why they didn't dismiss the case is because they believed, and they said to me directly, that they believed this officer was credible, even though his body camera footage didn't capture this, because he's saying, well, it happened before the body camera footage turned on. And so this is the situation that we're dealing with. We're back to the police officer's word versus the word of the member of the public. And that's what we're trying to avoid by using body camera footage and by having that available. Um, so I just want to point out that there is just not much in the current NYPD policy that even references a plan to improve transparency or accountability. And again, based on NYPD's recent staunch and vocal opposition to State Senator Jamal Bailey's plan to re fully repeal Civil Rights Act 50A, which again is imperative for achieving transparency and accountability, it does not appear that the department intends to use body-worn cameras to enhance transparency, but instead intends to expand police power and surveillance. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, te thank you for your testimony. And um, I'm gonna, just a quick question. Can you physically see when the police turn on the body camera? So you so, see some, footage? Yes, sometimes you can. You can see them lift their hand to push the button on because that 30 second period has already started. But it's very clear when to, you're very, it's very clear when you can distinguish between the buffering period and when they've turned it on because there's no sound during the buffering period. There, there is no sound in the buffering period. The audio only kicks in 30 seconds later. Yeah, we, we've heard stories of dead silence <laughs> in that 30 seconds sometimes. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Councilman Richards, for holding this hearing um, and inviting uh, the Brennan Center to testify. My name is Laura Hecht-Palella. I'm a legal fellow with the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center. We're a nonpartisan law and policy institute that seeks to improve our systems of democracy and justice. As part of this work, we have documented the body camera policies of police departments throughout the United States. And in addition, body cameras were one of several tools that we analyzed in a chart published last month on the NYPD's surveillance technologies. As this bill contemplates, it's important that the NYPD's use of body cameras is overseen closely by the city council. Although body cameras are often heralded as a straightforward tool to improve law enforcement accountability, in fact, they raise significant concerns related to privacy, data retention, and disclosure particularly when used in conjunction with other technologies like facial recognition, body cameras could conceivably function as mass surveillance devices of ordinary New Yorkers. Given the history of body cameras in New York City originating out of a lawsuit challenging the NYPD's unconstitutional stop and frisk program, it's important to ensure that surveillance of marginalized communities is not a byproduct of a program that was intended to improve accountability and repair public trust. The Brennan Center is concerned that the proposed bill does not go far enough in ensuring body cameras do not Im improperly invade New Yorkers' civil rights and civil liberties. For example, retention of body camera footage for a year or more under NYPD policy generates a large database. We heard today that they already have 8 million uh, videos in their database. And the NYPD should be required to make generalized reports on who is accessing the body camera footage and for what stated purpose, whether it's for um, a particular case or just for generalized investigation. The City Council should also require the NYPD to report on whether and how often it shares body camera footage with federal, state, or other law enforcement agencies. It's imperative that the City Council requires the NYPD to report on its use of biometric tools to analyze body camera recordings. Um, when the NYPD was testifying earlier, they mentioned using algorithms to analyze their body camera footage. And if uh, they're also using facial recognition, this raises concerns about Fourth Amendment and uh, First Amendment free speech. We 
cannot continue to address surveillance technologies like body cameras in isolation. When these tools are used in combination with one another, they create layered surveillance that's incompatible with a democratic society. It's worth noting that body cameras would be covered by the POST Act, a proposed bill that would require the NYPD to disclose basic information and issue privacy impact reports about its surveillance tools. Because the POST Act would require high-level details about body-worn cameras, it would be a valuable companion to today's proposed bill, which mandates more detailed reporting on specific incidents. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hello? Okay. Chairman Richards and fellow council members, my name is Lenora Easter, and I am a staff attorney and the team leader of the early defense team for the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today and for your interest in this important matter. As a public defender for over 10 years, a recurring concern I often hear from my clients is the expression of dismay that their voice will be unheard and disregarded when it comes to encounters with the police, that the officer's word would hold a greater weight than their own. As you know, and as we've spoken here today, NYPD's body cam program arose out of the stop and frisk litigation in the case of Floyd v. City of New York. After declaring the practice unconstitutional, the Federal District Court directed that NYPD institute a pilot pro project with the body cameras, noting that the cameras would, and I quote, provide a contemporaneous objective record of stop and frisk, allowing for the review of officers' conduct by supervisors and the courts. While we were initially hopeful that the body camera program would help our clients finally have a voice, this has not happened. While we now see body foot footage camera um, in many of our cases, as our colleagues in BDS stated, it really captures the full story. And that's because NYPD's policy, uh, body, body one camera policy, is poorly formulated and rarely followed by the individual officers. As we all know, uh, the patrol guide states that an officer must activate his body one camera prior to engaging in or insisting, assisting another uniform member in police action. This is mandatory for all uniform members of service as well as specialized units. However, what we are seeing in the Bronx is that majority of the officers are failing to follow their own protocols or exploiting the large loophole in the protocol in order to avoid capturing street encounters. And the loophole that I, re that I refer to states, quote, in the event of an unanticipated or exigent occurrence, activate the body one camera as soon as it is feasible and safe to do so after taking necessary police action to preserve human health and safety. Now, while this exception seems reasonable on its face, we have found that officers have exploited it in order to avoid recording stops and searches of individuals suspected of criminal activity altogether. I want to discuss two examples briefly. Take the case of our young client, we're going to call him Nicholas, who was charged with possession of ammunition after police approached him on the street. At a suppression hearing in the case, the officer testified that while sitting in the car, he and two other officers noticed that Nicholas was walking down the street in a suspicious way. Based on these observations, the officer made the decision to get out of the car and approach Nicholas and say, quote unquote, hello to him. This approach initiated a series of events which ended with Nicholas being tackled and arrested. Now, although the officer was wearing his body worn camera the entire time, he failed to press record until after Nicholas had been tackled and placed into handcuffs. When asked by the court why he didn't activate the body one camera before getting out of the car and approaching the client, the officer responded, quote, I don't have an answer to that. He later testified in the same hearing, quote, I didn't have to turn it on until I thought it was okay to turn it on and I didn't have to turn it on before I exited the vehicle. Now, as a result of, the, of this, the entire initial stop, the entire search was all um, not captured. So basically what was happening here was the officer was able to completely control the narrative in this particular case, not giving the court the, uh, the opportunity to make an objective decision as to whether the stop was legal or not. Another case that was handled by our office, we'll name her Susan, a 59-year-old woman with no prior contact with the criminal legal system whatsoever was in her house cleaning when her oven sounded the uh, smoke alarm. Police and fire department arrived, banged on her front gate. When she told them she was fine and didn't need assistance, they broke the gate, stormed into the apartment, and they tackled her. She was arrested and charged with resisting arrest and obstructing governmental administration. 
Now, in the process, she sustained serious injuries to her knees and back, which later required surgery. Now, though the police officers who participated in this arrest were wearing body cameras, the cameras were never turned on, and only one was turned on once a Susan was actually put into arrest. After they had forced her way into the home and they assaulted her. Once again, the body cameras were not recording when they should have been. These are just two stories of many instances that we're seeing in the Bronx where officers are failing to follow their own stated policy and have relied on the loophole of, in that policy to avoid recording interactions with their clients, with our clients. In both instances, these officers used their discretion in deciding when they were going to record. The Bronx defenders applauds, applauds the City Council for introducing legislation that demands more transparency and requires the NYPD to report important information about the use of body cameras. The public would certainly glean insight into information that has been held solely by the department. However, we believe that the City Council can go further in their role in overseeing the body camera program. So the Bronx Defenders respectfully offers the following recommendations to the Council in order to work it into its oversight capacity. One, as has been stated here, we suggest increasing the pre-event buffering period to two minutes. As uh, Council Member Richards and as our uh, colleague from BDS has stated, there are several big cities, um, Atlanta, DC, as well as Houston, that have the same technology and they are able to capture the, uh, have extend their pre-event buffering period to two minutes, where NYPD still has it in 30 seconds. NYPD must do the same. This, it will increase, this increase will reduce the likelihood of incomplete footage and problems that are associated when officers fail to activate the recordings when they're supposed to. Our second recommendation is to close the exigency loophole and provide clearer guidance to officers and the public. The current policy, which gives po police officers complete discretion in determining when to start recording on the basis of unanticipated or exigent occurrences, leads to too many critical encounters that will not be recorded or partially recorded. Turning on the body camera should be as, as second nature as calling in to the radio at the station house. This loophole will presum presumably present to ensure, was presumably put in place to ensure safety. However, it raises more questions than the problem it seeks to address and in our opinion, should be eliminated. Lastly, but most importantly, we believe meaningful sanctions should be imposed to officers who fail to comply with the NYPD policy. Now, NYPD spoke a little bit earlier about certain um, steps that they take when, when the officers don't follow um, the directives, but we currently, there, to us, there's currently no disciplinary policy in place for violations or failure to comply with the proper protocol. And the only way to ensure that the body cameras serve the intended purpose of enhancing police accountability is by, is by specific, specifying clear consequences for failing to record critical encounters in violation of departmental policy. The department must make clear to its officers and to the public that these measures are in place to ensure compliance. In conclusion, we believe that it's imperative that New York evaluate and adopt the policies for the use of the body camera um, program that are consistent with the law and public expectations of privacy and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Richards. My name is Michael Zizitsky. I'm lead policy counsel with the New York Civil Liberties Union. The NYCLU has long believed that with the right policies in place to govern their use, that body cameras can be a powerful tool for transparency and accountability, but without clear commitments to those principles, they become just another tool for police surveillance and another shield for departments to use to protect abusive officers from public scrutiny. And the NYPD has yet to demonstrate a truly sincere commitment to using body cameras as a tool for increasing transparency and for repairing relationships with communities. We must continue to demand greater transparency from the department regarding its use of body cameras, including through the legislation before the committee today. But this must be part of an ongoing and broader examination as to whether the public is actually receiving the promised benefits from the thousands of cameras now deployed in our communities. The single biggest threat to the effectiveness of body cameras is the enormous level of control officers and departments have on the devices and on the information that they capture. Uh, troublingly, the NYPD's policy expressly permits officers to view their own recordings prior to providing any official statement regarding an incident. Um, earlier, the NYPD testified about its process for uh, certain use of force incidents, critical incidents, where the footage will be seized um, and not accessible to anyone, uh, I think, as I said, until the department uh, deems it uh, permissible, deems it appropriate. 
What they left out of that conversation was the fact that NYPD policy views it as appropriate for officers to view their own footage, even in critical incidents, even in uses of deadly force, prior to giving an official statement to investigators on that matter. Uh, at best, this type of provision risks scenarios in which an officer's recollection of events is inadvertently colored by what they see on the footage, and at worst, this provision provides officers who are under investigation with the opportunity to deliberately tailor their statements based upon what the footage reveals. This provision and the lack of any clear commitment in the policy to hold officers accountable for failing to adhere to the policy suggests a refusal by the NYPD to accept that body cameras are primarily meant to be tools for enhancing police accountability. Uh, the CCRB has reported that it's been encountering significant delays in obtaining body camera footage. We heard a lot about that earlier. Um, the NYPD testified that there are some requests that get processed within 30 days. Those requests are the exception. Uh, in the CCRB's November statistics report, uh, the agency reported that 57.5% of their requests for body camera footage from the NYPD have been pending for at least 30 days, uh, and 16.4% of their requests have been pending for 90 or more days. And it's worth emphasizing that the CCRB operates within 180 days statute of limitations uh, to bring charges uh, against officers. The NYPD attributes these delays to their need to review, in some, some cases apply redactions to recordings, uh, which is unlike their process as they described for sharing footage with DAs, uh, in which the officer can share automatically the full unedited uh, recordings with prosecutorial agencies. Um, unlike the agency tasked with civilian oversight, which is forced to endure these excessive delays. Uh, as a government investigative and oversight agency, the CCRB should generally be afforded direct access to unredacted footage from the department, as, in the case, as is the case in places like San Francisco, New Orleans, and Washington, D.C. Uh, to do otherwise would be to suggest that the NYPD views this technology primarily as just another gadget to collect evidence for use in criminal prosecution. Uh, and last month, the department released a policy to govern the release of footage related to critical incidents, uh, which we heard a great deal about earlier. The policy says that the NYPD will decide within 30 days when to release footage constituting representative samples of critical incidents and of salient events leading up to them. But this policy does little to allay concerns about excessive delays and unchecked uh, discretion. A policy that frames the release of footage in terms of representative samples and salient events is not enough to inspire public confidence, especially when it's the NYPD deciding which samples are representative and which events salient. At worst, it suggests uh, more of a concern about controlling the narrative around these types of events than it does uh, express a commitment to a full public accounting of officer actions. Um, and lastly, uh, there was some discussion about whether or not uh, officers should be activating cameras at level one encounters. Um, I just want to be very clear that the example that's often used and that was used earlier is the officer searching for a missing child as the classic example of a level one. But level one encounters do not have to be focused on kind of the, uh, the feel-good stories about policing. They have included, and courts have found level one uh, encounters to include requests for ID from people standing outside public housing buildings. They've included scenarios where officers approach someone and they're resting their hand on the butt of their gun, um, which creates a climate of intimidation, one that can quickly escalate and perhaps escalate more quickly than an officer can turn on a camera. Uh, so we have always believed that cameras should be turned on for all investigatory encounters, including level one. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. The NYCLU remains hopeful that we can get these policies right and that body cameras can be a tool for transparency and accountability. But again, this needs to be an ongoing conversation. And if it becomes apparent that these cameras are not uh, being used to enhance transparency, to give public defenders uh, the access that they need to footage for their cases, and that instead these cameras are primarily being used for surveillance and tools for prosecution, then we have to be open to reconsidering whether the substantial sums that we're currently spending on this NYPD program could be better invested directly in our communities. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you. You want to add anything else? Anybody have any? Okay. Thank you. We got it. It, it. it seems like you're going to have that, that sit down with the police department uh, about uh, what sort of reporting requirements they should be. If, if there's one thing uh, that you really should require of them, it's, uh, it's that they should uh, give you a, a very complete report 
on non-recording and under-recording. Got it. Thank you. All righty, last panel. Tawaki Kamasu and Head from the Center for Constitutional Rights. Albert Fox Khan, Surveillance Tech Oversight Project. Naoki Fajita, Take Root Justice. Mr. Waki, I heard that we, we messed up a little bit. I'm not sure. I heard we messed up on getting you your opportunity to, yeah, so, so I apologize for that in advance. So, all righty, no problem. Uh, all right, let me make sure I have everybody else. To what, all right, I got you, Naoki Fujita, Take Root Justice, no? Ann Head, Center for Constitutional Rights, right you're here. Albert Fox Khan, oh, he left, okay. Uh, anybody else wish to testify, now is your moment. All righty, seeing none, you may begin. <laughs> like how the cameras are supposed to work, right? <laughs> right. But thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Ian Head. Uh, I'm a senior legal worker at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Thank you for inviting us to testify um, here today. Uh, and I'm part of the legal team on the Floyd litigation that has been talked about throughout um, this morning. Uh, I think I'm just going to read part of my written testimony and then maybe address a couple things that were said by the NYPD um, earlier. Uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights has been involved, as has been um, talked about, uh, with New York City's body camera program and policy since 2013. We feel strongly that body-worn cameras by themselves will not bring about more accountability in policing, but instead the cameras must be paired with robust systems of oversight, transparency, and discipline within the NYPD. The need for police accountability and civilian oversight continues to be incredibly high in the six years since the Floyd decision. While the reported numbers of stops and frisks may have declined, the NYPD struggles with accurate, accurately documenting the true number of stops, and more importantly, severe racial disparities and discriminatory practices remain. Furthermore, recent and ongoing incidents of police violence and other misconduct show that there is yet to be a real and necessary culture shift with NYPD rank and file in regards to the policing of communities of color and real accountability for officers who endanger and violate the rights of New Yorkers. The communities of color that were at the center of NYPD's illegal practice of stop and frisk and that continue to be the most impacted by police violence and misconduct should have a central role in determining how body-worn cameras and footage are used. As part of the same remedial decision ordering the body camera one pilot, the Floyd court correctly stated that no amount of legal or po policing expertise can replace a community's understanding of the likely practical consequences of reforms in terms of both liberty and safety. This continues to hold true in 2019, and the Center for Constitutional Rights believes that the voices and leadership of these communities must be given the same, if not more, weight than any other decision-making body, including the NYPD, when it comes to body-worn camera policies. And I'll just stop there and um, address a couple of things. I've, it felt like throughout the NYPD's testimony, um, there was talk of lots of consultation with uh, community stakeholders. Um, and I think just to, from CCR's perspective and experience in the monitoring process and the Floyd litigation, um, while there may have been some consultation leading up to the body-worn camera policy, I'm not, I'm not sure whether it was quite as robust as testified to. And to my, to my knowledge and, and our knowledge, the, uh, the new policy around critical incidents um, release, uh, we hadn't talked about, uh, we were unaware. A um, Couple other things really briefly. Uh, there, um, I think just, just in regards to kind of how community input has been talked about in regards to level one stops, uh, I believe it was stated that this was something that came from the plaintiffs. It ignores again that there was a uh, almost two year process of, of community input 
um, and a, a 300 plus page report that was ordered by the court and that came out in 2018 where um, uh, level one recording of level one and level two stops um, in regards to the, the DeBoer um, uh, case um, uh, was a really important, um, really important to the communities being impacted and so, and the communities represented in the Floyd litigation. And so I think this wasn't just something that plaintiff's uh, attorneys came up with. Uh, we thought level one, recording level ones would be a good idea. Um, uh, again, we we believe that that the the ideas from community input and from the impacted communities are the ideas that need to shape how these policies and these tools uh, are used. Um, I think uh, I think I'd stop there. We support a lot of the things that have been said in regards to uh, making sure uh, family members have access to video um, uh, in regards to the problems with the massive lags and back backlog with uh, CCRB, uh, getting CCRB footage. Um, and we include in our testimony some suggestions uh, in regards to maybe capturing even more uh, data in uh, the public advocates uh, intro bill, um, 1136, uh, and um, uh, kind of making it more specific to making sure it does capture those level one and level and report on level one and level two um, uh, encounters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Head. Hi, I'm Tuwaki Komatsu. Um, two years ago on December 26, 2017, I was in this room testifying to Corey as well as Vanessa Gibson about the NYPD against the NYPD. Um, I sent an email to you on November 8th about having arrangements made for today's hearing such that I could present video. I got no response whatsoever. I talked to you on November 13th at the mayor's public town hall meeting. Same request, no response. So as a result, I'm going to have today's hearing canceled pursuant to New York's open meetings law. Um, before I do that though, let me play some pertinent audio and video recordings. The first one is uh, the CCRB's interview with Sequoia officer, um, sorry, NYPD officer Sequoia Harris after he illegally stopped, assaulted, seized, harassed, injured, and arrested me. Here's a key comment is on red and uh, did you take any um, video or photos on your cell phone? Yes, from a department issue body camera. Uh, the whole encounter is recently recorded. Okay, but uh, on your... That's it. Um, so the reason why that remark is pertinent is because I'm still, I still don't have 75% of the NYPD body camera video from that incident. I only got 25% the last about 10 minutes, it's two years after the incident. So the point is, you heard a lot of lies today while Oleg was in the chair under oath. The question is, um, if you're a leader, what exactly are you going to do to get me all of the body cameras um, video before my December 11th uh, court hearing for trial in front of a jury? Um, next video that I'm gonna play for your benefit is the actual NYPD body camera video that I got, a very small fragment. Here we go. So it's a public sidewalk. Question is, if I'm walking on a public sidewalk, conducting myself lawfully, why in the hell did I have an NYPD officer put his hands on me? And guess what? I'm not black. Kicker is, IAB exonerated me. They substantiated my complaints against NYPD officers. Uh, lady Pierre. So you can figure that out. Hold on. Why is the fucking federal judge having a fucking hearing about how often you ask those lies? A post one. Pick of an EDP, East 156 in Clinton, have a bus, one additional, 90. Clinton Avenue. Hold on, boss. Is there, not, is there a sign saying you can't do listen, that? Listen, yeah. Is there a fucking there sign? Is there a sign saying no passes? Is there a sign saying no passes? 10 5? Exactly. Let me cut to the chase. Um, Four months after that incident, he was involved in another stop, people in an Uber. Guess what? He didn't have his body camera on. So the question is, I met him on December 26, 2017, 12 days after I was in this room testifying. I, didn't, I still haven't gotten 75% of the NYPD body camera video. Four months thereafter, 
CCR, CCRB reports confirm he didn't have his body camera on either. So the, I guess the question is, who in the hell next is he going to victimize by not having his body camera on? And is he going to use his gun when he doesn't have his body camera on? And what are going to be the, I guess, repercussions when people like me sit in this room are telling you face to face, truthfully, lawfully, that recourse, appropriate redress needs to be taken such that, you know, there won't be a next victim. The last question is this, can you get me that body camera video before December 11th? Uh, I will have Jordan from my staff follow up and we will do our best. And I guess the other thing is, with regards to preparations for today's meeting, is there any reason why arrangements were not I, I didn't get the direct email, so I apologize, but I want to thank you for coming out and certainly testifying, sir. Thank you, Judge Schofield. All right, thank you. Thank you all uh, for coming out, and we look forward to continuing to follow up. Uh, this is a great hearing and a start of where we need to go to make sure that there's more transparency and accountability on body cameras. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you for my Southeast Queens colleagues for hanging in there with me. And they didn't have coffee. Oh, she had coffee. Oh, y'all do have coffee. All righty. We all had coffee. Thank you all.